and we see that there is a growing interest among stakeholders decision makers policy makers uh, um, you know city city governments um, uh, even uh, neighborhood especially the the local uh, ngos and 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 also donors also see this uh, as an important area uh, now uh, considering that uh, uh, that this this session uh, we will uh, initially I will do a quick introduction of what uh, we in, in WRI we are doing and then we'll go on to discuss about uh, uh, the panel discussions uh, uh, where uh, the first session will be on towards um, scaling up. We do a lot of pilots how to really go beyond scaling up and how to uh, really uh, take it to more cities, more places um, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, the second is that uh, looking at um, nurturing neighborhoods challenge. Uh, it is really to focus on infant, toddler and caregivers friendly neighborhoods in Indian cities. Uh, and then the third is on uh, looking at enabling safer commute uh, to schools uh, uh, for children and also for youth uh, through uh, technology. Uh, so now I will quickly share my screen and start presenting the uh, on what we are doing. All right, hope you are able to see my screen. Um, we all know uh, that we have the largest number of children in the world uh, and Along with that, we also have this responsibility of thinking through uh, with the growing urbanization. What kind of cities are we really developing and what kind of especially the public domain? Um, you know the streets and public spaces. Uh, how are we really shaping them for children? This challenge of uh, you know growing challenge of uh, road safety in the city in, in our cities. 43 children lose their uh, lies on Indian roads every day. Every three minutes a child dies in India because of inhaling toxic pollutants in air. Where are our children really playing? Uh, we have most of our Indian cities have very less of public spaces and uh, and even those public spaces whatever available is also really uh, dominated by vehicles and other activities. How are we really creating spaces like the way Kurtiba has done? Uh, they they went from a phenomenal change in increase in public spaces uh, through uh, organized planning within a short period of time. With this perspective, what do we really think about a children friendly city? How to really think about transforming our cities considering children at the center? How to do uh, think about urban planning, design, management, uh, all together in, in really considering children at the center. Some of the work we are doing uh, around this, uh, we are very grateful uh, to our donors who have been continuously being supporting on this. Uh, we are working across 27 cities in India related to um, children uh, oriented uh, interventions. Uh, children here we are really talking about three uh, approaches. One is to really develop a model of iterative process of working with cities, uh, of going and talking to children, their caregivers, their teachers, uh, the school administration, and, and really understanding their needs and then using that to really come up with solutions and capacity building for, for the service providers or, or, the, or, the, or the agencies who are involved in development. So how to create this, uh, bridge this uh, to develop a working model that cities keep uh, continuously doing these kind of projects. And then the second is to really think about how to uh, create a data oriented decision making around around children and their needs uh, how to bridge the existing gaps in data and uh, how we can um, help help cities to take take that up and scale up in in a larger context and so we are thinking also about how this idea can be scaled up across cities and also across agencies across um, across the non non-government agencies uh, to uh, to take it forward 
so some of the projects we are talking about uh, botner uh, child road safety challenge uh, here um, uh, supported by botner road safety challenge it's a safer commute to school uh, in rotak project where uh, we went and spoke to 4000 children across the city to really understand their route how do they walk to school or how do they reach to school what are the risks they face what improvements could be done in those areas and really arriving at solutions and taking that to the uh, to the city administration and and the stakeholders to really come through um, uh, come at look at solutions what can really be really improved and uh, looking at tactical interventions to uh, to demonstrate it on ground and and build consensus around that now these are some of the improvements which can be quickly be achieved through tactical interventions which were done here and then taking that to really conduct capacity building um, to the stakeholders in the cities and and doing a community outreach through city uh, open streets programs such as rahagiri uh, now we are also thinking of how to scale this up and uh, working with irc um, um, helping irc to develop a, a school zone safety uh, guidelines and uh, similarly we are also working with uh, 22 districts of this of haryana state to uh, arrive at haryana vision zero now uh, similarly for the schools uh, there is we are also working on the mobility for youth uh, as, as in rotak um, supported by botner uh, uh, child road safety challenge and here it's also in partnership with haryana police and um, and local administration here again the uh, idea is to really look at what are the challenges uh, uh, faced by youth in traveling to their places and arriving at solutions for those areas and do capacity building for the stakeholders to implement them these are some of the ideas similarly in gurugram we are uh, with the support of fia foundation we are doing some work on uh, identified uh, this one of the city as an uh, one of the school as an example uh, of of uh, developing uh, public spaces around that safe walking uh, access towards the school and we conducted a whole lot of uh, stakeholder discussions with the elected representatives and other stakeholders and came up with this idea of installations and and uh, tactical interventions this used to be a very muddy road uh, which was not really safe for children and now this kind of wide footpath and and uh, more safer public spaces were uh, were implemented through trials now similarly in mumbai uh, the safer access to schools one of the school area which is uh, part of the um, one of the area was identified various risks were identified and various activities happening around it we went and spoke to children uh, of various age groups what are their aspirations what do they want to see around their school what can be achieved and taking that to the local councillor and really and understanding what can be done and taking that to further implementation these kind of solutions were prepared now coming to data gap we said data is one of the major areas so towards that uh, this we have developed this safe access to schools uh, data visualization tool for bangalore this was uh, prepared with the support of underwriter laboratories this tool is uh, launched in the bangalore session of connectoro um, uh, where we are looking at uh, safety um, you know understanding of risks around schools in bangalore a similar kind of work we are also doing in um, uh, with the support of 3m uh, around uh, schools at risk in in mumbai we found that 28 percentage of the schools in mumbai have uh, had some fatalities in the last few years around the in in their areas and similarly in gurugram it is 46% uh, now coming to uh, this scaling up idea of this uh, we are very grateful to uh, ministry of housing and urban affairs uh, for conducting this challenge uh, of nurturing neighborhood challenge in collaboration with uh, bernard van leer foundation where uh, wr india is a technical partner in implementing it here we are looking at a good start for all children Uh, which is especially the zero to six year old children, uh, especially the most disadvantaged children. How to create better uh, neighborhoods for them? That means these mostly these children are spending time in their local neighborhoods, uh, and how neighborhoods can become a module of of development uh, of the city. We are looking at uh, reimagining parks, public spaces, amenities around these areas, access to anganwadis, public health centers, these kind of ECD services. These are the types of projects. uh we 
we had 63 cities uh, applying for this challenge and uh, right now we are in the second phase of the challenge where 25 cities were selected and they are implementing pilot solutions and they're really looking at these kind of local areas in their neighborhoods to uh, in make improvements for young children and their caregivers these are the various kind of implementation which is happening and uh, further going ahead we will uh, we will select 10 cities uh, through this and and then uh, they will continue to uh, work on this for next two years. Uh, so with that, I will end the presentation and uh, now I will invite my uh, colleague Nandini uh, Chandrasekharan to take it forward uh, and, uh, for the first panel discussion. Over to you Nandini. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first session of the Child Friendly Cities track. Um, we are very excited today to have a distinguished set of panelists here from some of the leading foundations and uh, organizations that are supporting transformative changes in India and globally um, around child friendly planning and design and really looking at the full spectrum of childhood from the prenatal stage up through adolescence. Um, and uh, with more and more cities in, in India uh, adopting child friendly programs and projects, um, this conversation is really focused on um, how we can start scaling up these types of initiatives. So um, to introduce our panel, um, uh, I'd, uh, I'll just go uh, one by one. So um, we have with us uh, Aggie Krasnolutska, the programs manager at FIA Foundation, and um, Atsani Aryabo, manager of Global Road Safety, uh, the Global Road Safety Projects for the Global Road Safety Partnership um, with the International Federation of Red Cross. Um, and Eva Moldovani, um, Grant Manager for Nation Botnar, uh, Pavan Kumar Singh, uh, Country Business Leader of the Transportation and Electronics Business Group at 3M India, and Rishna Majid, India Representative for the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. So uh, a warm welcome to all of you and thank you for, for joining us today. Um, to begin, I mean, this conversation is about scale, but uh, we would like to start sort of maybe um, a little bit more at the micro level and thinking about um, painting a picture of what kind of impact this uh, this uh, uh, focus on, on uh, this lens of, of child friendliness can have um, on uh, uh, a, a particular child, a caregiver, or a community. So um, if I could request each of the panelists to share an example or a story from the context of your work um, about the, 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 the impact of these initiatives, um, that would be great. So uh, maybe we can uh, begin with uh, Aggie. Would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you very much, Nandini. Good um, morning, afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to um, join uh, the conference. And I would like to share the overview of the Vision Zero for Youth project in district of Gurugram that was implemented by colleagues from WRI uh, India with the support of the FIA Foundation. Uh, the vision of this project was to deliver a safer commute environment for children and to develop a scalable safe school zone model in state of Haryana, which has very alarming uh, road safety records. Uh, Vision Zero for Youth recognizes that starti starting with youth can be a catalyst to build wider support for Vision uh, Zero. And obviously, schools are a very strong, uh, powerful platform for change in every community. So as part of the project, we were aiming to improve streets, their design, eliminate traffic fatalities and serious injuries, improve safety in school zones and other places where children and uh, youth walk and bike. We obviously wanted to engage with the key stakeholders as well, as that's uh, crucial in uh, any developmental uh, projects. And uh, we started with um, signing the MOU with the municipality and the, and the city of Gurugram uh, and got their approval and their endorsement from the very get-go. Uh, in order to target right places with uh, most needs, uh, we work um, with the data, transport and crash data. This really helped to identify places that uh, really need the implementation of, uh, of solutions that we had uh, in mind. Uh, and uh, we found the priority areas. Follow that, uh, WRI signed uh, uh, an established partnership with, uh, with schools, five schools that uh, collectively cater for uh, 2,000 um, children. It was a uh, really critical, uh, a very critical part of this project 
to make sure that solutions that we develop and create uh, are really fit for purpose and they are designed and brought about in the collaborative uh, approach and spirit. Uh, so it was really important to get really close with, um, with school communities, with students, with teachers, uh, with parents and get their input. What do they perceive as uh, really important to improve their safety? What is Mm, what are the challenges they're currently facing? Uh, what can be done to improve that and uh, and change for the better? Uh, so also, uh, so we run a number of the focus groups, also in the spirit of the collaborative approach. We um, worked uh, with the municipal uh, corporation to organize two workshops that brought together the communities around schools, uh, officials from uh, from the city and obviously students, uh, parents and teachers. So they walk the road, uh, they walk the routes and they identify challenges, obstacles and good things about the route. Uh, unfortunately, there were not many good things that they could uh, say about safety of, uh, of those pathways that they were taking. Uh, I mentioned earlier, it was really important to bring the stakeholders, decision makers. Uh, so we also focused quite a lot of time and attention on the, uh, sensitization of police officials and uh, municipal corporation uh, officers. Uh, they were engaged in various of discussions, obviously, but there were also more educational workshops. And um, there I say probably it was first time or one of the first occasions when they talked about people centric planning and uh, safe system and, uh, and vision zero. Uh, but uh, discussions continue that I know from colleagues from uh, WRI and the process of sensitization and bringing this into this whole concept of streets that are owned by uh, people rather than vehicles it continues. Um, findings from all these interventions, discussions, uh, research uh, were then translated into road design to make the commute to school safer. So 200 meter street outside one of the selected schools was uh, redesigned with spaces identified for footpaths, pick up and drop off facilities, waiting areas with art for children, um, safer crossing zones before the school gate and the road signage and easy navigation uh, and uh, check speeding. Um, the road was also resurfaced and uh, there was really nice contribution uh, from the municipal corporation who actually funded this and uh, endorsed further changes of this sort going forward. So just to wrap up, the project um, have been designed to encourage an inclusive approach to delivery of road safety interventions for safer streets uh, for young people. And not only it showed that um, this kind of activity has the very positive impact on uh, child friendly uh, on, on the communities, uh, but it also uh, showed that well focused leadership and resources can produce effective desired engagement uh, with local governments, NGOs and the private sector. And um, it, it's one project, but, uh, but we believe that this will lead to further scale up and uh, interventions like this can be rolled out across the uh, whole entire country and, and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aggie. Um, Rishta, uh, would you like to share? You, you mentioned you have some images as well to, to show. Sure, thanks uh, very much, Nandini. I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, but um, in terms of answering your question on uh, child-friendly design and planning and whether it has uh, and how it has affected a particular community or uh, individuals. Um, so I, uh, in terms of the Bernard Van Leer Foundation, we focus on an initiative which is called Urban 95. And I want to talk a little bit about the initiative and maybe then go into a concrete example uh, visually as well. Uh, so the Bernard Van Leer Foundation is a foundation that has uh, been focusing on early childhoods for the past uh, 60 years uh, or more. We have been working only on early childhood, even though we come at it from different sectors of uh, parenting, urban, uh, which is the topic of our discussion, health, nutrition, and so on. And uh, we are increasingly looking at the age range of zero to five. So Urban 95 is our initiative where the 95 centimeters is basically the height of a healthy three-year-old child by WHO standards. And uh, what 
the uh, Urban 95 does is basically ask this question of city planners and decision makers and managers of what would you change if you were to look at the height uh, at a city from the height of 95 centimeters, which is basically um, I, I cannot show it visually right now, but a short height. And once you have that perspective and when we work in cities and work with cities, we feel that the perspective changes in terms of understanding what are some of the needs, not only of young children of zero to five years, but also of their caregivers, which is basically mothers um, and fathers and any other caregivers in the Indian context, it is extended family. And, and therefore, if you think about it, if you're thinking about, for instance, mobility, you are suddenly designing for mobility for not one person, which is an able-bodied adult uh, going from work to home and uh, vice versa, but you're actually designing for two people because uh, a mother is going to be holding a child while they're crossing a street or while they're accessing an early childhood service um, and uh, or they're walking with a toddler or you're looking at parks and playgrounds and greenery where uh, you really want that space to be welcoming and inviting not only to the young child but also to their caregivers so that they come back and they come again and again for that experience. And so, uh, so this particular initiative in India also we are working uh, under Urban 95 in a wide range of cities. Uh, and uh, three of our partner cities, our lighthouse cities, are Bhubaneswar, Pune, and Udaipur. Um, and also in partnership with WRI and the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, we've launched a Nurturing Neighborhood Challenge, uh, which is a uh, challenge inviting cities to become part of the Urban 95 and the Nurturing Neighborhood Network. And uh, I'm very happy to say that about 63 cities applied and 25 cities are going through the challenge phase right now. Uh, so we are expanding and, and we'll get into the discussion when we talk about scaling. Uh, but just to say that how it affects uh, people in an individual basis under Urban 95, we are asking cities to think about uh, um, all kinds of uh, uh, areas related to city design and planning. So one could think about mobility, one could think about public space and access to early childhood services, air pollution, nature, greenery, and so on. Um, so I'll just quickly uh, share um, a presentation, uh, not in, not really a presentation, but a couple of images, and I don't know if this is visible, uh, Nandini. Uh, but this uh, picture, from my perspective, captures very well how uh, something like Urban 95 or a focus on very young children in cities can change um, uh, change lives on the ground. And so this picture is from Udaipur. This is a square that is called Nayoki Talai. Uh, this is a community space, but it was uh, uh, taken over by a lot of um, uh, garbage and trash, but also a lot of car parking. And uh, this, but this is a vibrant community space surrounded by uh, families of very young children. And so uh, what the city did in collaboration with our technical partner there, Italy South Asia, um, and with our support is basically clean out the space and make it playful and accessible for young children. Um, so this is just one example of how uh, something that was unused and was not really uh, something that that was taken over by parking and by um, stray animals and so on, was now suddenly a place where families could could come out in a, a very uh, dense part of the city. This is from the um, the old city in Udaipur, which is uh, uh, very um, heavily populated and very few public spaces. And so suddenly this opens up an opportunity and a space for people to come out and enjoy the space. Uh, the second image that I just wanted to show, is, this is from a maternity hospital in Pune. Uh, this is uh, the Sunawane Maternity Hospital and here, um, there was inside the hospital, there was not really much space for people to sit as they waited. And this was an intervention that the city did in collaboration with the local, um, with the technical partner in the city uh, to basically clear out again space that was taken over by parking, by trash, by uh, stray animals, and really build some seating areas outside that were colorful, that were playful, and could be used by families of young children, and also um, permanent in this case. This, this may seem like a very simple um, intervention, but it made a huge difference in terms of uh, the experience that people had. And uh, and so, uh, so I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, bring these two examples forward in terms of how this is actually changing uh, lives of people. If you think about COVID right now and uh, social distancing, not always possible in our heavily populated and dense areas, but maybe interventions like this can make it easier 
for uh, people who are accessing early um, childhood services to be able to uh, access these uh, in a in a much more friendly way. So thanks, Nandini, and back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Rishtan. Um, uh, uh, Pavan, would you like to go next? Thank you, uh, Nanni. Uh, so I'll just give a little background of the program that I'm going to talk about. Uh, as I told in the beginning that, uh, 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 you know, I'm a practicing uh, traffic engineer uh, uh, 24, 25 years. I have actually seen the various aspect of that. And uh, I uh, uh, strongly feel uh, in case of India and uh, there are foreigners here. So in front of them, <laughs> you know, I have to tell that. But uh, particularly in this country, our generation has actually failed completely failed in terms of elevate the uh, you know the road safety in this country uh, so the only hope that we have right now is to uh, do something about the next generation uh, if we are actually not doing that then we are not doing our duty at least the people like us are not doing our duty uh, that uh, these are the minds uh, if uh, we we are able to inculcate the right uh, spirit uh, in those minds uh, where these people are going to be uh, going to be the millions of change agents that we have to create across this country. Uh, the people who are uh, right from the very tender age, uh, they are actually uh, having this mindset of uh, sharing the road space, uh, respecting others right on the road and things like that. Uh, that is something which is missing in this country and that is something which is actually causing havoc of uh, you know 150,000 people dying and things like that. So uh, that was the uh, that was the whole uh, agenda when we actually started that that a uh, uh, lot of things are actually happening in terms of uh, improving the safety, improving the engineering, uh, also talking about education, but not much has been done in terms of uh, doing something with the kids. Uh, so uh, that is where uh, this program actually uh, took the shape. Uh, you know, it was somewhere in uh, we started working on that in 2018, uh, but 2019 when we uh, kind of uh, gave it a shape uh, where uh, we uh, uh, and the program was actually uh, named after a lot of deliberation as uh, 3M Y Car uh, Y C A R uh, 3M Young Change Agents for Road Safety. Uh, so that is uh, that was the program which was actually uh, created where we uh, uh, at that point of time we thought uh, that we are going to be quickly covering uh, at least 100 schools uh, uh, and then it is something which is going to be uh, we had uh, a couple of NGOs which are which were supporting us uh, uh, we had United Way uh, we had uh, uh, you know IRAP uh, which was actually a part of uh, this whole initiative uh, initially uh, and uh, uh, what difference uh, uh, so there are many programs which are going on and how actually we wanted to make it different that most of those uh, educational program for kids were uh, generally uh, they were the uh, classroom kind of trainings right we wanted to uh, make these people these uh, young kids as part of this uh, whole initiative uh, so it, we wanted to make uh, it uh, a real experience for them uh, so these uh, what so this was a three day program which was actually conducted in the schools uh, for the for the students of class 8th to class uh, 10th uh, and uh, you know almost uh, for every from every school uh, you know uh, uh, 70 to 200 people actually participated in over the uh, three days uh, so apart from the normal uh, uh, the education in terms of the road safety in terms of inculcating the right habits that how they have to behave on the roads and things like that uh, we also uh, told them that you please uh, uh, tell us that what exactly can be can be done uh, to make uh, the school zone around your school safer, right? So, uh, and we were actually uh, surprised to see the kind of initiative which came from those young minds, right? I, I as a traffic engineer, I was amazed to see the kind of uh, a kind of uh, uh, you know uh, ideas which came from those young minds. Probably those people had a, not even. Uh, heard about road safety before that, but when they were actually told that these are the, you know these are the problems and uh, we need your support to improve the situation, uh, they were actually taken uh, you know in the contingent of uh, uh, groups uh, around the schools and they were actually told that these are the areas how it can because you are coming there every day in the morning you are actually leaving you are seeing that what kind of problems you are facing, so. And then, you know, ultimately on the uh, on the uh, second day, they were actually given a Google map, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, spreadsheets and the 
uh, there they had to actually draw the interventions which they feel is going to be improving the situation so uh, uh, they did it so beautifully uh, that uh, you know uh, some of those examples probably i can share and you can see that that uh, everybody who was actually involved in this was actually uh, amazed to see that uh, what we did post that was that we were it was actually tweaked with our technical team our traffic engineering team worked on that uh, we tweaked some of those interventions and then with our uh, csr fund we actually implemented that uh, so this is something which uh, you know happened uh, on uh, uh, so we had the uh, it started with pune uh, we did it in uh, Mumbai. Uh, we uh, did it in uh, Delhi and Gurgaon. Uh, so this is uh, this is something which uh, actually uh, we want to uh, scale it up. Uh, and uh, you know, just uh, I, like uh, Nandini, uh, if you allow, I was telling you that I'll share a, a particular video. Just uh, you know, maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, it is something which is going to be just to hear those uh, kids what actually they have to uh, say. I'll just. Uh, Can you see my screen? Uh, if you can, yes. can you see the screen? Yes. Sir. Program. Uh, first of all, uh, please uh, first of all, we thought. That it was not a very uh, important issue, but when uh, the teachers explained us thoroughly about the topic, we came to know that it is the most important issue that we have to improve. What did you feel after doing that role play? We started seeing uh, towards road with a responsibility. How did you feel today when you did the road act, road audit, actual road audit? We were just thinking about, no, this should happen, that should happen. But when we practically saw that we can also do it, we are also the next generation which can uh, make a change in India or in any part of the world. So that time we thought that we should take interest in it and we should uh, try our best for our country because it's our country, not others. And uh, the best thing I like about the 3M company was that instead it's a um, uh, minister and mining and manufacturing company, but still it's trying to make uh, the uh, young youth aware about the uh, road safety because the best thing uh, in India means uh, to change people's mentality is the most difficult thing but it should be started and the best thing from where it should be started are the small and the young youth of our country so i like it the 3m company and i would also try for it yeah so that's uh, that's pretty much about uh, uh, the program. I mean, I've, you know, when uh, we actually uh, move on, uh, some more details and my experience, I can actually uh, share. Anandini, thank you. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, Atsani, and maybe then Eva, if you could go ahead. Thank you, Nandini and Pawan. That's a great example. Thank you very much for that. Uh, firstly, a little bit of background on the. Botna Child Road Safety Challenge, which is managed by the Global Road Safety Partnership uh, as part of the International Federation of Red Cross. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but uh, uh, we're currently operating in the 13 cities in seven countries um, with 15 grantees, two of which, of course, in India, uh, Rotak and Jorhat. So, um, but uh, let's step away for that from a second, and if I can just make one uh, one major point, uh, and using another example, you, uh, at uh, another project in Vietnam, actually, in Pleiku uh, City in AIPF, where uh, when if we talk about impact and scaling up, I think uh, the example that I like to give, and the one point I'd like to give, is the importance of uh, advocacy and uh, policy and legislation. Um, Lo and behold, it wasn't even an objective of um, of the project, but um, AIPF, through their great work, um, actually advocated for a lot of uh, um, uh, legislation change uh, in one of the circular, where it basically uh, gave a lot of more flexibility for individual cities to uh, to determine their own level of speed for um, uh, in front of schools. Uh, we did, uh, you know, as you know, Vietnam is very um, uh, is very centric uh, in terms of the governance. But this is, was a, a great step forward where uh, uh, communities were able to determine in terms of uh, of uh, of, uh, 
of the speed around schools, which is now uh, recommended at 30 kilometers an hour. So um, where we initially, you know, wanted to affect um, two pilot schools, for example, and which we did through a multi-sectorial interventions, uh, engineering, of course, and then enforcement, and then road safety education. Uh, but uh, but the, the policy angle and the advocacy towards it actually essentially not just affected the uh, the community in play coup, but essentially tens of thousands of uh, students and schools um, in Vietnam where this is a national legislation, which is fantastic. So if I can just uh, basically uh, hit home on that. Um, so that's from the, from the from the top part. Advocacy is important, but from the bottom part, um, it is for for me. Um, uh, it, it was it was instrumental for us to have projects that are very much um, uh, smart in its essence in terms of uh, capturing data. So we've been able to sort of like uh, been able to thoroughly do that through, of course, the very encouragement of the Foundation Botnar, which is very much uh, data centric. So uh, things like uh, monitoring evaluations have been very uh, a key part of our program. So we've been able to determine, for example, in play coup, uh, the average speed around two of the schools were reduced by five kilometers an hour for um, uh, for the average speed of motorcycles, and in fact, 11 kilometers an hour for for cars. So those are kind of things that can actually be translated into potentially uh, reducing of uh, serious crash and injuries. And moreover, we also um, uh, in, part, in partnership with IRAP, we use their star rating for schools. So in terms of engineering perspective, Pawan, uh, we can see that the, the, that the environment around particular schools have been elevated from two stars to five stars, for example. So those are the kind of things that are very important. So in summary, basically the advocacy angle and then also the uh, capturing of indicators and uh, via a very, uh, very robust monitoring and evaluation framework. Thanks, Nandini. I'll take over and uh, welcome everyone. Glad to be here. Um, the project I would like to talk about um, is from our Healthy Cities for Adolescents and program that we fund at Fondation Botnar. Um, that particular program focuses on adolescents aged 10 to 15 in selected um, secondary cities around the world. Um, with the ultimate goal to develop and strengthen sustainable and equitable community systems. The program focuses on overall health, advocacy, partnerships, technology and innovation, for example, such as, you know, e-health to contribute to the well-being of young people. The project that I would very briefly like to present in a nutshell is located in um, Cali in Colombia and is implemented by uh, Fundación Despacio and um, also WRI, the, the Center for Sustainable Cities, are involved. One of the first projects or sub-projects with our funding was actually to transform a bridge. That particular bridge um, is very important to connect different communities. Um, the project partners provided adolescents with tools to identify risks and propose potential solutions. The project is very unique because it involved six different government entities, so very strong partnership approach. It involved various communities and um, different schools. It's not only about routes or transforming routes, but it's very much about um, the safe built environments. The bridge used to be dark. Um, there were various safety issues such as violence, and it was just not a very inviting bridge to cross. Um, with the tools and the support of the young people who've been actively engaged in the transformation of that bridge, um, the bridge is now, you know, a colorful place where people meet and connect. Um, the project had vari various components to it, such as um, educational components around road safety. Um, there were sustainable mobility components, active mobility, gender equity, and also spatial orientation tools. Again, like Sani mentioned before in the Botnar Child Road Safety Challenge, um, also here, the gathering of lots of data um, is is very important. They have a very solid M and E framework, which supports them in scaling their approach um, to other inter intervention sites in the city. And also, of course, the partnership approach with the many government entities that are involved support that particular scale. In summary, the transformation of this particular bridge 
um, supported to overcome an invisible barrier between communities and is a great starting point for further implementations in cities. Thank you. Thank you, Eva and, uh, and Adsani. Um, I, uh, so I think you know a lot of, uh, of uh, through, through this introduction actually um, uh, we've, we've touched on a lot of different points related to even uh, you know what 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 helps to support scale. So um, uh, we've mentioned, for instance, uh, having a multi-sectoral approach, the importance of sensitization, consistent sensitization um, uh, of leadership, um, advocacy in policy and legislation, and robust monitoring and evaluation, um, and a holistic focus on the built environment uh, and involving children in 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 uh, the, and and their caregivers also in the um, in the process of this decision making. So um, I wanted to, to kind of focus in now a little bit more on um, uh, what kinds of projects have been effectively scaled uh, in India from, from your experience and um, uh, and what were some of the innovative uh, ideas that worked and, and helped support that scale. Um, I know, uh, at Sunny, you mentioned also about um, uh, sort of this data centric approach and I know that um, um, there's been um, some really uh, creative use of, uh, of artificial intelligence and, um, uh, and technology. Um, uh, Maybe you could uh, start and, and, and speak about this, and, and then if others would also like to respond and share. Um, great. Sure, and uh, I think this is where I probably can put in at least a little bit of the um, Indian example. I'm not sure if I'm sharing my screen. Can you see? Um, yes, we can see. Yeah, uh, I, I think again, I uh, we don't have all day, so I, I'd like to make one uh, one or two key points. For me, um, a couple of the learnings, for example, with your organization, uh, Nandini, has been that it's been great to uh, to see uh, in India, um, you know, the the very uh, the very essence of um, you know good partnership between uh, between sort of the the community, youth, government, and also the private sector, which has been good. Uh, and, and for me, the biggest takeaway in terms of scaling up is uh, you know there's there's numerous things, but I think for me it's is very much the the the, the, the snowball effect, uh, where, for example, if you make a good case towards uh, what you're doing, uh, and then uh, base it around, uh, as I mentioned before, the indicators and sort of the clear, very clear outcomes um, of what you intend to do, and you align that value proposition with other people, then you get this, uh, you cr cr start creating this tribe and excitement. So, for example, like uh, like like 3M, like Pawan, I need to. Uh, my job would be to align that whatever your strategy is and what how your approach is. And if that's not aligned, you will never ever trust me to join, collaborate together. But if we do that, um, uh, I'm I'm quite certain that uh, that you know if if our approach and values are aligned, we would be able to sort of like uh, collaborate together. And I will have you on board. And then with you having you on board, then perhaps your network will come on board as well. So that snowball effect that, that that's really uh, that's really for me been hitting home uh, quite clearly in the last three years. Um, and, uh, and a good example of that is again in in, in Vietnam. Uh, you know we have uh, we have no numerous private sector coming on board that are interested in sort of like this off the shelf sort of program and product that we have. It's like wow, that's a great approach. Oh, you're saying you're telling me you're aligning it with SDGs. That's fantastic. And you're also doing it in um, in a way that uh, that is you know uh, that is aligned with our beliefs and values. That's great. So you have Mercedes and Honda coming on board, and with that, um, you know, other private sector and other donors take notice and go, oh, okay, that's that's fantastic. Um, I think we, I, I'd like to join too if you can. I'm like, and I'll and I'll be, I'll say, great. Um, you know, here is two schools we've done. Uh, would you like to sponsor a third school? So that kind of an effect of the value proposition proposition and also sort of the the the, the business case. Um, and also sort of like the very clear sort of outcomes and goals that you want to do. Um, I think it's it's uh, it's the key to sort of scaling up. Thanks, Nadine. Uh, yes, Aki, please. Uh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to um, second totally everything that Atsani said. Uh, I also wanted to add and what I said earlier and stress this very close collaboration with decision makers, uh, the power of advocacy, power of reaching out to them, educating them, showing the uh, importance of solutions um, that uh, that need to be implemented to make children safer. Uh, without their endorsement and without funding that they can unlock, uh, 
we we will not get the scale. It's um, there are a number of organizations that support activities like that, but uh, we really need money allocated in cities and country budgets for uh, for those interventions. So that's one point. And in terms of innovation, I just wanted to um, highlight the IRAP star rating for school uh, application. It was mentioned uh, by Adsani, it was mentioned by Pavan. Uh, I'm sure everybody here is uh, aware uh, of, um, of this application, but it is really powerful tool and yet very simple tool, accessible to everybody, simple methodology that allows to assess uh, safety around school pre and post intervention. It's got this um, added beauty that it can be used by anybody, whether uh, through the application on the phone or paper version. Um, so a little bit more old fashioned version, but that that's the opportunity as well. And uh, it can collect data or can help collect data that in very many places is not really available. Uh, and um, having uh, this show being able to show and having this proof that the rating goes from one star or two stars to four or five is really powerful in uh, in the discussions back with the uh, politicians and whoever is the decision maker uh, and uh, I wrap um, the star rating for schools has been used I hear in 38 countries already uh, and assessed, used to assess 770 schools and 2000 people around the world are able to use the uh, methodology. So I think there is great strength and get, get good power in that. And uh, um, hopefully the innovation that goes around the world will really um, help to galvanize the change. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. I, I, uh, I see, Yatani, you have your, your hand raised. Uh, would you like to respond to a, a point that was just made? Or? Yeah, and just to, to hammer home on that, uh, what Aggie is saying, um, yes, we utilize star ratings for school um, in, in a number of our projects. And thank you, FIA and the likes of FedEx to, um, to continue to support its development. Uh, but you can also imagine how powerful it is uh, if you combine the, the, the two, technology and advocacy and youth. So I can see the uh, almost sort of uh, the, the the daunting aspect and vulnerable aspect if say uh, a youth or a youth group in India question their politicians why our school is a one star rating school. And then you do that in a, in a fashion where sort of like uh, youth and children gets involved in the politics uh, rather than being utilized as tokenism uh, in the heart's ladder of engagement. And that will be a very powerful message to send out. So just a thought. Uh, yeah, Pavan, would you like to? Yeah, so just uh, uh, taking a cue from whatever uh, was said earlier uh, uh, and my experience, again, I'll have, you know, uh, go back to my experience in India uh, that uh, uh, we, we started with the vision of doing it for uh, maybe 100 uh, schools and pandemic and all that, uh, you know, it kind of uh, was a blip and we couldn't uh, scale it up to that extent. And that was something which was supposed to be done with our own funds, uh, uh, CSR funds. Uh, and uh, we can uh, we can actually do that even now and we are doing that. Uh, but uh, India has got 1.5 million schools, right? So uh, are we, uh, so if it has to be scaled up and it has to be th thought uh, that it, uh, it is actually reaching to every uh, kid uh, at some point of time, uh, then uh, like uh, we talked about advocacy, we talked about uh, regulation, we talked about standard, that needs to be changed. And I have done it, uh, uh, you know, myself in various uh, capacities. I was vice president for IRC for many years. I was, uh, I've been part of those uh, standard committees for, uh, you know, more than one and a half decade, uh, working on many standards. Uh, so the real change cannot be brought in this country until unless it becomes part of this national standards, some kind of national standards, and then only it will be adopted by the local authorities. Until unless it is, uh, it is adopted by those authorities, it cannot be scaled up to the to, to, to the level that we want to. I mean, of course, uh, you know, we are doing our bit and that is something which is important, right? We are doing it for uh, 5, 10, 50, 100 schools. Uh, we are engaged with WRI to do a post and, uh, you know, pre and post study, uh, derive the benefits, uh, present it to the government, present it to the minister, uh, you know, going and, uh, you know, advocating it all the forums, uh, you know, giving the message in the conferences, all that is fine. But the real 
scaling up will happen if the national standards are changed and we are done, we are doing that uh, with the help of again uh, you know uh, uh, amit is part of that uh, wri is part of that uh, we have uh, you know uh, uh, we have already uh, uh, brought the uh, safe school zone uh, manual uh, for irc uh, that was uh, you know all the initial hurdles have been crossed uh, the final uh, committee meeting which is now supposed again it was postponed because of the pandemic and all that it's supposed to be happening now in uh, september uh, sometime uh, so if it is passed then that small book uh, can actually uh, if somebody takes that to the uh, to the municipal corporation uh, to the city authorities uh, to the police uh, it becomes a tool it becomes and you know somebody who's a, uh, having a positive mindset uh, he can also uh, spend a little bit of money just because it is part of the standard before that it becomes very difficult for him in india with the bureaucracy around us it becomes very difficult if he, even if he wants to uh, you know spend uh, maybe a couple of 100000 rupees for something very nice and very noble uh, very difficult for him to actually take the decision so i think uh, around everything uh, you know when we are doing everything else uh, uh, we also need to focus on a country like india and i am not uh, too much aware about the other countries i mean of course uh, you know others can comment on that but here in this country if you want to scale up uh, you'll have to take that route uh, there is absolutely no second second way that's what is my take uh yes sir star i was going to uh, to say that uh, i think you would have a lot to say on this so <laughs> no it's a nice segue to what i wanted to say pavan because uh, uh in terms of scaling um so at bvlf uh, the bernard van leer foundation we believe that the the main way or the primary way to truly scale is to work with government so over the decades uh, in early childhood we have uh, of course partnered with various organizations and have been able to impact uh, the lives of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of young children and families but if you're really thinking about millions uh, then it has to be the government and uh, and therefore in about 5 years ago Uh, in 2000 a little more than 5 years ago in 2016 we shifted our strategy to be able to work primarily with government uh, so uh, our scaling work is focused on partnering with government to be able to then play the role of uh, uh, play the role of what we like to say um, kind of uh, we have this analogy within the foundation of the elephant and the mouse and we of course are the mouse and <laughs> the elephant are is this large uh, uh, governments that when they uh often perhaps they move slowly but when they move and are convinced of ideas then they will really rampage through so to be in a position where you can really um kind of provide uh that input maybe some flexible funding as well but mostly it is about ideas that you can provide uh to governments and once they are convinced then they will move forward with uh, with the full conviction and speed hopefully so that's how uh, we do uh, we think of scaling we also are thinking in terms of both going deep and going wide so both the horizontal scaling versus the vertical scaling as well uh, and one uh, one way, one example of that and you know this nandini because you are uh, at the center of this actually through wri which is the nurturing neighborhoods challenge so uh, an example of um, scaling under urban 95 is uh, the work that we are doing with the ministry of housing and urban affairs uh, launched uh, we launched this competition um, where a number of cities applied and uh, and through the ministry platform through the platform of the smart cities mission now we are working with uh, 25 cities and eventually with a smaller subset to be able to scale up ideas related to urban 95 and that would not have been possible if the ministry um was not involved uh and then the work in the three cities that we are in already bhubaneswar pune and udaipur is basically going deep to be able to test interventions to see what works what doesn't uh so that they can inform uh, other cities that will come after and and so therefore uh, i'm giving that example not only as an example of scaling but also uh, apart from government there is this idea uh, there is this focus on diffusion of ideas and within the foundation again even our work with government will be limited what once the idea spread there is no stopping it so and therefore that focus is there as well of where can you get the peers in this case peer cities to be able to serve as examples for other cities to um, learn from and replicate uh, so that's how uh, we look at uh, scaling uh, and of course our support therefore then comes in the areas that you've already defined and everybody almost has talked about this in terms of advocacy maybe some work in policy some uh, flexible funding looking at capacity um, and so on so all those gaps we can fill but the true scaling will happen through government from our perspective thank you 
Thanks, thanks very much, Rishtha. Um, so uh, related to this, actually, I mean, one of the, the uh, points that you've made is about this, the importance of being able to convince uh, decision makers. And um, uh, and I think, uh, um, you know, they're, 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 we have seen uh, that in many cases, um, there's sometimes this challenge of, um, of uh, encouraging decision makers to to address the very specific needs of different um, different age groups, for instance. Um, um, a lot of the time there's this view of uh, um, that um, that any any sort of actions that are taken need to affect a broad um, you know, uh, set of the population, and so um, I was just curious to, to hear from the panel about um, what has worked well in terms of you know making that argument and um, and and how to ensure that those um, those unique requirements of uh, of different age groups are really being addressed um, in the development scenario. If anybody has uh, thoughts to share on this. Uh, so Nandini, I mean, my my experience, uh, that, and that's not only for this cause, but uh, when I'm I'm talking about that, my 15 years, uh, 17 years with IRC, working on the many standards. When you go with the the idea, which is which looked like uh, uh, an utopian idea uh, to most of the people out there in the committee and subcommittee and subgroups, uh, uh, I always find that uh, 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 you know if you were if you're really sincere to whatever you are actually uh, and you are actually true to what you are taking it to them, uh, you will definitely find a champion, right? Uh, in that uh, group, and that's 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 in the government. And you know, my experience, 25 years, I've been working uh, directly and directly with the government. Uh, people say that uh, you know, like uh, Rusda said, that uh, uh, you know, the elephant, right? Uh, true elephant, right? But then uh, in India, and again, I'm saying uh, <clears throat> my personal experience that one of the brightest mind you will find there. Right, uh, you know they get they may be they may be uh, you know lazy to take the decision. They may be uh, you know they may delay the whole thing. But it is intelligence is something which you cannot challenge. Uh, the one of the most intelligent lot, and then of course they come from the civil services, probably the one of the most coveted uh, uh, you know job in this country. Right, so they, you will find them. So it is it is it is uh, only uh, what you have to try is to find the real champion for your cause. And that you will find uh, in any ministry, in any government, in any authority, in any uh, agency, uh, in any regulatory body, <clears throat> you will find that. And then you have to actually uh, piggyback him, her, uh, and uh, you know, start your advocacy. And that is something which might take time. Sometimes it happens quickly. Sometimes it it will take some time. Sometimes you have to actually cobble together a few more people. Uh, but that's our job, right? If you are passionate about something, that is what you have to do. And uh, you know, we've been uh, successfully doing that. Something which you start today, you feel that it is totally impossible. But in the next two years' time, that becomes the favorite subject for everybody. Everybody is talking about that. That how nice that idea is, and why it cannot be done, and why how quickly it can be scaled up. And that's what is that's all is happening in India. So uh, you know, just by telling that uh, you know things will not happen, it's not right. But of course, it takes effort. It takes effort. Maybe I can add uh, Nandani to what again Port Pavan said because I agree with 100% with everything he said uh, of finding the champions uh, within government and those champions are there and sometimes we find that the champions move and you have to restart. Uh, but that is of course, uh, as you rightly said, Pavan, that is our work. And sometimes we follow the champions also to the next place that they go to to carry this spread of ideas. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how uh, we also work. Uh, I do want to say to your specific question about uh, because we we are hyper focused on the zero to five and in many cases the zero to three uh, because of all the arguments related to brain development and sometimes when you go to decision makers it there is the question of focusing on all children um, versus uh, a particular age group so um, so we do find that as sometimes a challenge however the way we approach it is uh, is I mean two quick points on that one is that uh, we're not asking cities or decision makers to start something new or to build cities only for young children or to only focus on that age group. What we are saying is that in the projects that you have, in the programs that you're doing, in the work that you're already doing, can you bring this extra lens in so that it in particular benefits this demographic? So in the case of even the nurturing neighborhoods challenge, these are probably going to be ongoing projects that the cities are doing and how do you tweak them a little bit so that they become more conducive to young children and their families and caregivers because it's going to have a, uh, a humongous, a huge impact on their uh, 
uh, early years and therefore the rest of their lives. Uh, the other pieces that we like to say is that cities that work for the very young are likely to work for all. So children and very young children especially are very good indicators of uh, what is working and what is not working. So if you put that lens at the center of your planning, uh, then that's likely to have a wider, deeper impact for the rest of the population. So not to ignore anyone, but it's just that you put this extra lens on to be able to deliver uh, services uh, better to your citizens. So that's how we like to approach it. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Nandini. Thanks. And Eva, you, um, you raised your hand. Would you like to respond? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So I just want to say that, you know, I think there are very interesting ways um, to reach to reach various age groups, um, in particular adolescents and young people, you know, for example, through the use of digital and frontier technologies, which provide a unique opportunity to engage with youth and digital natives to include their inputs, um, in particular in urban planning. Um, you know, digital use, digital tools can be designed and used to collect, you know, various kinds of data, you know, bottom up neighborhood level data, you know, to large scale city level on various issues. Um, I'm sure you all know um, Safety Pin in India and their idea of um, building gender inclusive and youth responsive cities. And they, for example, use spatial data through a technology platform, um, which is collected actually by young people and then shared with city and municipal governments and they use data as a tool for advocacy and um, government response. However, I think, um, you know, to answer the second part of your question, and in, in particular um, in rapid development scenarios and where de decisions have to be taken fast, um, there is always a risk that particular voices or in particular youth voices are just being used um, as tokens and their, you know, sacrifices or neglect around meaningful youth participation in favor of fast decisioning. Thank you. Uh, yes, please, that's Ani and then Agi. Thank you, Nandini. Uh, just to hit home again on the importance of data here, um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've heard Rushda and Pawan mention about advocacy as well. And uh, GRSB has been working in this space with Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, you know, for the last 10 years, uh, particularly in India. Uh, we've been trying to uh, and finally succeeded, actually, uh, last year to amend the, um, the Motor Vehicle Act of uh, 1988, 1988. And, uh, and, you know, and, and you, know, you talk about the elephant in the room and uh, a lot of my colleagues and uh, a lot of the willing uh, coalition of the willing in, in India would say, how do you, how, how you know, how do you tackle the elephant in the room? It's uh, pieces by pieces and slowly by slowly. But uh, uh, data forms a big, big part of that uh, of that arsenal. And so to to be able to uh, slowly uh, uh, sort of justify the cause and 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 almost in the case of uh, India, almost embarrassed the government to say like, hey, you have the indistinguishable, indistinguishable figure of India having 11% of the world road safety, serious crashes and injury, and you're the, also one of the leading countries in terms of uh, of uh, in the developing countries in terms of road safety, 220,000 road deaths, and that's a very understated figure. You have those kind of um, massive uh, data to back up your claims, uh, it, it helps very, very much. Thanks, Randy. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, yeah, data absolutely uh, is, is crucial. Um, I wanted also to uh, very quickly put um, into the mix the, um, the safe system approach and um, Vision Zero, which is the philosophy that no death or serious injury should be acceptable in the mobility system. Um, so in this context and in, in this framework, returning streets to uh, pedestrians, um, returning streets to young people, um, uh, is um, is opening the concept of who is um, benefiting uh, because access to safe uh, cycling, safe uh, walking will contribute to uh, and will address issues of um, mental health, of obesity, of crime, violence, isolation, deprivation, all this um, uh, really, um, uh, really uh, negative impacts of, um, of, the, of the city that we currently are um, seeing. Um, so this this will um, support development and the growth of 
every member of the society. So I think bringing the concept uh, and framing this around a safe system or around Vision Zero um, really help uh, in terms of the top level thinking and uh, united advocacy that can come from very different uh, parts of the civil society. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, did you want to respond? Uh, I thought I saw your hand. Uh, no, okay. Um, well, I, I, I mean, there's. Thank you, thank you all. I mean, there's, there's so much more actually to, to discuss, but I think we are um, sadly, uh, you know, coming to the end of the time. But I just wanted to um, give an opportunity also, um, in case anybody had a follow-up question for somebody else on the panel or um, anything that uh, uh, you're interested to, to ask, um, we can uh, just take a minute for that. I just wanted to and say that it's a pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure to to be with uh, each of you on the panel and have this discussion and exchange. And I think, as you say, Nandini, we could just spend another five hours, ten hours, few days discussing and uh, exchanging. But uh, I, I really hope we you know we come at some point uh, as a group working on the joint project. That that would be a really nice conclusion from uh, from the panel. Really great to know all of you. I mean, I'm I'm meeting uh, uh, each one of you for the first time, but uh, absolutely, absolute pleasure. Uh, and uh, you know, like uh, said, sometimes uh, looking forward to see you in person uh, in India uh, or somewhere else in the world. <laughs> and I uh, I echo that pen sentiment, Pawan. Yeah, I hope to be able to uh, speak with you offline as well. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't approach 3M. Uh, just so you know, yeah, you guys have been uh, already a partner with us in South Africa, yeah. your colleagues in South yeah. Africa, which is fantastic. Uh, Aggie as well, I haven't had the pleasure to meet you, but I work closely with Avi and Saul, uh, of course, uh, and Rush Rushda, I've met you already, and Eva, you know, uh, you see me a lot in my reports. So, um, and thank you all for the collaborative effort, um, you know, towards the second decade of action for road safety. We can't do it if all aspects of, uh, of civil society uh, philanthropies, uh, foundations that don't come together. Um, and, you know, our, the, the approach for us at GRSB is always that collaborative um, effort. So again, thank you very much. And Nandini as well, thank you for the facilitation. Great. And just to add also very quickly, Nandini, that uh, uh, no, I'm always inspired by all the work that everybody here is doing. And I just hope that we continue to learn from each other uh, and to what you said, Agi, to work together as well in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Also, big thank you from my side. Um, I can only second what Rusha and also Sani said um, around, you know, the joint learning journey and the collaborative efforts. And uh, thank you very much, Nandini, for facilitating this session. Absolutely. Thank you all very much for, for, for joining and participating and sharing all of your insights with us. Um, and thank you to the audience um, who has uh, joined for this session. Um, we, we very much appreciate um, all of the uh, the work and, and support um, uh, from FIA Foundation, Bernard Family Foundation, <laughs> Foundation Botnar, 3M, um, and the Global Road Safety uh, Partnership. Um, and um, we hope um, that uh, we'll, we can continue this conversation going forward. Um, uh, for those who are in the audience, uh, please do uh, join us for the next session, which will be focused uh, more specifically around um, the project that Rishal mentioned earlier about the Nurturing Neighbourhoods Challenge. Um, and um, uh, we will be studying that shortly. So uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Hello everyone, welcome to session 2, which is Nurturing Neighborhoods for Infant Toddlers and Caregivers. I am Madhura, Senior Associate from WRI India. Let me take you through the agenda uh, for the session. So uh, in this session, we will be looking at an overview of Nurturing Neighborhoods Challenge and the initial activities that are being undertaken by the cohort 25 cities towards early childhood centric development. 
After that, we will uh, we'll have presentations and discussions with the experts who have joined us here today, um, who would be taking us through why is it important to design cities for young children and caregivers, as well as they'll help us explore softer measures going beyond physical and infrastructural interventions to change behaviors and attitudes to scale young children oriented spaces in cities. After that, we will we'll hear from uh, Ms. Hepshibarani Kodlapati about her experiences in shaping spaces that support women and young children in public offices. Let's now take a look at overview of the challenge. need exposure to safe and stimulating environments to develop their full potential. It is also the most vulnerable age, physical and emotional health, social skills, cognitive abilities formed during early years of childhood. These shape long, lifelong behavior, health, well-being and contributions to the economy. In the same spirit, we are launching the Nurturing Neighborhoods Challenge today to shape cities that work for our young children and their families. Nurturing Neighborhoods was the first platform where uh, Kochi has had an opportunity to think of urban planning and urban design from the perspective of children and the caregivers. To think about um, opportunities where these children can have free play and uh, an inventory of uh, experimental thoughts where uh, we can try different things. Six months, Kakinada Smart City aims to develop the model town area through a child friendly lens by testing solutions through trials and pilots as a part of our journey to transform into a child friendly city. We have identified few sites which are having heavy footfalls like race course, uh, library, uh, anganwadi and a school where we will try to have child friendly elements. school and all also so we can get our children over here 
because instead of going and looking for locations outside Baroda, yeah. come over here because when you have you know everything under one roof, why not bring them over here and show them? We are extremely delighted to invite Tim Gill, who is here with us today. He is an independent scholar, writer and consultant on childhood and a global advocate for children's play and mobility. Tim is a long-standing advocate for child-friendly urban planning and design. His book, Urban Playgrounds, How Child-Friendly Planning and Design Can Save Cities, was published by Royal Institute of British Architects in 2021. With this, I would like to invite Tim to begin his presentation. Thank you very much, Madhura. I will just get my slide deck up. And as I do so, I just want to say what an honour it is to be uh, speaking with you today. And I will indeed be sharing a lot of the insights from my book. You can see the cover there. Um, and really expanding on this idea of child friendly planning and design and, and, and what it is and why it matters. But I'll just start with this map, which I use a lot. And this map illustrates what you might call the roaming range of the home territory of four children at the age of eight years old, but they happen to be in four generations of the same family and all lived in the same city. So you can see the big area that takes up most of the map is the roaming range of the great grandfather in this family at the age of eight. And you can see the circles shrinking until you can see the yellow dot in the, in the corner there. That's the, the roaming range of the sun at the age of eight, uh, a few years ago in the same city. So what this illustrates is what you might call the shrinking horizons of childhood. And, and it, this change is happening all over the world. And I think it's profound and underexplored. And it provides the starting point, I think, for a conversation about how we can make cities work better for children of all ages. So with that, I'm going to offer a definition of child friendly places. And it really captures two dimensions. Uh, first is that dimension of mobility. Um, how easy is it for children to get around in a neighbourhood, crucially to get around by themselves? And then the other dimension is, you know, the things that children can do, the, the play spaces, recreation, are there facilities nearby, uh, nature? So it's only where you have both a lot of offers and experiences uh, in a neighbourhood and high levels of child mobility that you're in that quadrant there that's the child friendly place. And to give you an illustration of what I tentatively call the ultimate child friendly neighbourhood, I'm going to show you a few pictures from the eco suburb of Vauban, which is in Freiburg in Germany. And you can see it's, it's a medium density development. Uh, the key thing about it is that uh, it's effectively car free. So if you own a car and most people don't, uh, you have to park it in a car park around the edge. So the whole of the space between the buildings is available for play, for socialising and for public use. So here uh, is indeed an image of the uh, big car park. There's great public transport links. Um, so the streets can become uh, really feel very different. Um, and I think that's a really um, uh, a, a lighthouse that we can aim for in other developments. I'm not saying it's a blueprint. It may not be exactly replicable in your city, but I think it's, as I say, it gives us a sense of direction. And so to take some, uh, to apply it theoretically, this is a diagram from the Bernard Van Leer Foundation and its Urban 95 initiative, which really captures uh, the, 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 the idea of a neighbourhood being a focus for an intervention. Families don't live in cities, they live in neighbourhoods, but also pulling together some public space improvements and mobility improvements. 
And one of the nice twists about the BVLF idea is to, to make them center around an early childhood service, which particularly picks up, I think, on the mobility challenges um, of families with young children. And this is a diagram that I've uh, taken from some work BVLF did, and I use it in my book, that shows the kind of trip chains that young families make, which are often very local, uh, that happen every day, um, quite complex, and really raise questions about the, the, the walking and the cycling within a neighbourhood that families can carry out. Here's a couple more illustrations of, of what I think of as a child friendly intervention. This is a, 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 a just a simple public space outside of a library in Tirana in Albania. Um, here is a actually it was a, a, a program to cut down on um, road accidents in Fortaleza in Brazil, but simple low cost way to reclaim space, reduce the space and the speed of traffic. Um, this is even more uh, simple. It's just grabbing a little bit of space in a favela uh, in Recife in Brazil, a part of a, a, um, a favela improvement program in that city that's really started to engage with children and young people's needs. So that's some illustrations of what child-friendly planning is. Why does it matter? Well, in the cities that I visited, there were really three clusters of rationale, strategic reasons for becoming interested in this topic. Um, the first was around children's rights, children's health and well-being, and, and child development. The second was around sustainability and the idea that, you know, a child-friendly place is green, it's compact, it's easy to get around on foot. These are all qualities of environmentally sustainable cities, which of course we're going to, to have to address as we come to terms with the climate crisis. And then the third uh, set of rationales were really much more hard-nosed and about the economy and the demography of a city. And the realisation that, to put it bluntly, a city that is losing families is a city whose long-term future is bleak. Um, I'm speaking to you from London, uh, where earlier, uh, just a few months ago, there was an important legal case on a, on a tragic case involving the, the death of a child who had many asthma attacks. And she is now the first child for whom uh, the cause of death, uh, air pollution is attributed as one of the factors of her, of her death. And so this is in effect, you know, in, in London in 2020, uh, children are dying because of poor planning. So this is this is a global problem. But child friendly planning also matters because it chimes with what children themselves say, what they like and what they don't like about cities and neighborhoods. You can see the sort of list of don't likes, uh, likes and don't likes in the table there. And really that uh, concerns about moving around, places to meet, uh, greenness, really mapped very well onto that framework of child friendliness that I showed you earlier. Um, and now the final rationale around economy. Um, one of the cities that's most fascinating and that I devote a whole chapter to in my book is Rotterdam, which realised about 15 years ago that families were leaving the city because they felt they could get a better quality of life somewhere else and that that was a real problem and that the city devoted significant millions of euros into making the built fabric of the city, the parks, the spaces, the streets, more child friendly, and did indeed turn around that image. So Rotterdam is now a city that families want to live in. So thinking about going to scale, now this is an emerging agenda. Um, it's not yet mainstream. So in my book, I offer some suggestions about how we can um, scale up. Uh, and first, I think we need a, a, a program model. Um, we need to pay attention to the impact of what we're doing and count what counts, but we also need to be opportunistic. So I'll just pick up those issues now. This is the hub and spoke model that I talk about. Um, and at the heart of the model, in most of the cities that I looked at that were doing effective work and trying to go and starting to go to, state, to scale had an official in the municipality who was, was a kind of catalyst for work, who worked with transport and planning, who effectively involved children and families, had a focus on residential neighbourhoods, made sure that both public space and mobility were addressed, and also thought about indicators and, and evaluation. In my own book, I offer a set of indicators for a child-friendly neighbourhood. I'm not going to read them all out to you, but but it, it's a, it's, and it's 
if, if I'm throwing it out there for you to look at, but each of these 10 statements start with a statement from the point of view of a child. I walk to school, I go outside and play with inside of my home. And then you can have sub indicators that will help you to work up um, how you could measure the impact of a programme. And in terms of opportunism, I could really uh, wanted to share with you this very um, compelling example. This is from the city of Ghent, where there was a major regeneration programme happening in one of the more deprived parts of the city. And what the, the planners and the child friendly officers came up with was a kind of child friendly layer as part of this regeneration, looking at connecting up existing public spaces, creating new ones and thus you know, really opening up the neighbourhood so that it could breathe and so that families could get around. So pulling this all together, um, I, I'm going to use the words of Enrique Peñalosa, the former mayor of Bogota, who really helped to turn that city around through taking the maxim that children are an indicator species for cities. And I take that literally. I think that in the same way that if you see salmon swimming up a river, that's the sign of the health of that habitat. If you see children with and without their parents, different ages, being active and visible in a city, then that's the sign of the health of that human habitat. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for your insights on how to design children-friendly cities and how um, and, and for highlighting that children are indicators of a healthy city. Now, I would like to take this privilege of asking you a few questions. Um, while implementing such initiatives in cities, there are a lot of ups and downs, uh, which bring sometimes bring fatigue amongst the agencies. In such cases, what are different ways of creating and identifying champions to build back the enthusiasm? Sadly, I don't think there is a, a, a single recipe. I, I did think time and again, the cities that I visited, there was there was a municipal official who really took this idea and, and ran with it. So, so I really would invite cities and, and people working in cities to think about who might be that person and how they can be supported. And, and, and again, the political support is really helpful. And, and I guess one of the things in our favour with this agenda is that when you start thinking about children and bringing in children's views and a children's lens, you can't help but move to look at the future and the longer term and our collective responses to the challenges that cities face. And so you start to see a way to overcome you know, some of the short termism. Um, and I know that's difficult. You know, many cities, you've got a political cycle, you know, you've got short term budgets. But I do think there's a great scope for transcending that for you know getting beyond a very short-term approach by incorporating the views and voices of children as an idea but also in practical terms actually involving children um, through through different ways in programs and projects great thanks for highlighting the importance of involving children at various levels and looking at long-term initiatives and not a short-term goals my next question to you is about the current pandemic situation. We all have been confined indoors. Children have been confined indoors. And we have realized the importance of outdoor play. What are your perspectives on play during the pandemic? Sure, I, you're absolutely right. I think all of us have uh, become much more aware of the importance of, of local spaces, of being able to travel locally, uh, just how valuable it is to be able to get out, uh, you know, and, 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 and just spend time in the outdoors. It's particularly important. I, I hope this is obvious, but, you know, for families who are living in, you know, in poor housing, uh, in cramped situations, you know, they don't have uh, great, you know, gardens or, or wonderful green spaces nearby. So there's there's a real imperative, I think, to level up uh, the access of poorer families and neighbourhoods to uh, green and outdoor space. Um, I also think, you know, one of the things about the pandemic is, okay, we've known from very early on that children are barely affected by the disease itself, but are probably the almost the worst impact. So children have suffered the worst from the measures that we've had to take to control the disease. So, you know, with, with losing their, their education, being kept indoors, um, really we've imposed great sacrifices on children so now i think 
actually we owe children we, we 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 should compensate children for the sacrifices they've made in this last year and i can't think of a better way to do that than to make neighborhoods more joyful and playful places for them to grow up in well uh, that's such a strong message tim um, that we owe children and we need to create better spaces for them outdoors and now is the time I'm sure that this gives us hope and this will inspire cities to take these initiatives forward and create best place spaces for children in, in our cities. Thank you, Tim, for your wonderful presentation and being with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Thank you. Now that we have heard from Tim regarding the importance of designing cities for children and how to go about it, Let's now welcome our esteemed and diverse panel for today who would be taking us through soft measures which are beyond physical and infrastructural interventions for changing behaviours and attitudes towards scaling up children, young children oriented development in the city. I would like to welcome Bahar, Milan, Sarika and Swati uh, for, uh, for the panel discussion today. Firstly, I would like to invite Milan Rai, who is a conceptual artist based in Nepal and works across uh, social situations, interventions, architecture, urban ecology, community building, as well as the local government. I would now request you to start the presentation. So you can see uh, me with a grass mask and a broom. It was, uh, I stood in a, in a, in a city, polluted city uh, streets to highlight the threat that we live, uh, live with and the environmental degradation. So it was my uh, uh, idea uh, to, to you know, spark some conversations around this uh, urgent issue. So from the streets, I started going to, uh, I based around various departments, concerned departments, environmental departments, started meeting with the mayors wearing a gas mask because every time when I submitted my proposal, any document that would get lost, right? So. Uh, I started uh, using this uh, uh, creative uh, ways to, uh, to 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 get the attention. Attention. So it was in. Uh, so it was like it was not like one day, one time event. It was like twenty one months of uh, consistency. Every day I used to go there. Uh, even Saturdays I used to forget and be there, get there. I mean, like be there, reach there. So it was a daily advocacy, and uh, they they were not. Uh, Paying attention to what I was uh, pointing towards, so uh, I thought uh, at one point I thought I was waiting seven hours uh, to meet the mayor. So I thought, what am, am I doing this in this space? And I realized that uh, it is a time best. I called it a time best performance art. So when you are doing a performance, you remain focused and disciplined. So that's how I started complaining less, complaining less, and or I started organizing more. And I started going to uh, meet, I mean, like kept going. So I caught the attention of Lalitpur Metropolitan City after 21 months, mayor of Lalitpur City. So uh, I, uh, so it was a lot of, uh, there was no shortcut to it. It was a lot of uh, uh, time consuming effort, um, uh, establishing relationship, identifying right people. And uh, through that, uh, it, uh, I, I, I slowly started, uh, I, I started approaching, uh, and, uh, my ideas uh, to them, and then uh, uh, I, I say I shared my vision of a green urban greening and everything uh, and uh, and everything related to it. And the mayor said, uh, uh, you know, "What is your idea?" So I I said I want to transform neglected public spaces into community. Uh, sorry, public spaces, urban parks of different shapes and shapes and sizes. So. To avoid the procurement system, there were so many bureaucratic hassles. I, I said, just give me the permission uh, with you, with, uh, and I will manage the fund myself. And I started a small, I, we had identified a small plot of land that was encroached for a long time. And we uh, um, uh, managed the fund and we started this pilot project as a tactical approach uh, to scale up the urban greenings. Uh, so this was uh, the condition before. And we started transforming it. We trans we transplanted big uh, size trees to try and it, it and now it looks something like uh, it looks like this. So this is in a commercially concentrated area. It's a it's a very uh, in both sides. It's 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 there is uh, it's in amid the concrete jungle. So it's uh, so this place became a small wonder, a small phenomenon in itself. And people were be, uh, were visiting from different places. In this itself shows how much entire need. Of space, uh, uh, 
spaces yeah. so while i was busy making these uh, parks the government had other plans to make uh, like seven other parks and they were already gearing up for that and uh, i looked at their designs and they were very very problematic so uh, i said we need to read everything that design because the, uh, because it's going to cost it's going to it's 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 going to add more problems to urban problems instead of solving them so uh, the copy paste designs i criticized and i started uh, revising that old designs and and, and urged the mayor to rethink it and i uh, tried my best but i could not uh, you know stop one of the project that they constructed that they implemented crossing over 1 crore plus rupees and uh, spending a lot of amount and uh, yeah so uh, but after that uh, i i did not give up i uh, with the with this uh, success stories of this pocket park i was managed to convince the mayor to to uh, you know give us uh, the chance to uh, implement our ideas so this was in another uh, locations of four locations we approved we got approved uh, permissions from the mayor and then we began intervening these places uh, of the, of bigger sizes so these these are the parks and you can see a small uh, toddler holding a hand of a mother so he likes to come to this place every time and uh, i keep and uh, yeah so this is another park so these places so many places are being fenced and gated and uh, uh, we we said the public place should, should be accessible and uh, should not be gated like this so we dismantled every of the barriers and the people are flocking in from uh, the old people the young people everybody they come they, they, they are some of them are daily visitors so i'm so these are again another front fence and locked gate we we are dismantling this as well so we're opening it and then we are removing all the turf monoculture lawns and and uh, replacing it with uh, native grasses and uh, uh regenerative landscapes so uh this is another land that was encroached for 26 years uh for comp for personal benefits and uh so on so i mean i'm observing the commingling of strangers in in this new places uh, where where that are near completion so i'm uh and I, i'm interviewing them strangers and locals about how you how we feel about I mean about the ex about our access to public spaces and why we need such spaces so uh, i'm planning to do some case studies with our team to uh, to further uh, to further uh, uh, our uh, works and develop guidelines and principles that are out of place because without these guidelines uh, uh, we are going in uh, everything is trending in the wrong di wrong direction so networks of green spaces so this is another land that we are transforming is about near, near completion so uh, without any uh, organizational structure without any uh, uh, organizational structure and resources we uh, i was i managed to pull all this through simply through passion and uh, goodwill generated through my art uh, social art socially engaged art uh, as a socially engaged artist so i formed a team and uh, and and encourage everyone to contribute their time and skills voluntarily to tackle the issues complex issues and uh, and and at the same time we are also nurturing young conscious minds to uh, uh to social designs and environmental learnings and and, and knowledge transfers uh, so all of our interventions were done um, uh, with within a constraint of time very condensed window of time and uh, and resources so it was uh, a prevention i would say it was a prevention and intervention to stop to ease the ease the problems and uh, and minimize the damage so my action all of my action whatever i did was all into in, uh, was uh, was uh, needed so my action eventually collided uh, so this is one of the uh, most politicized interventions con controversial Uh, in, in all of my undertakings it was bled barren for 40 years There's so much urban politics so many uh, disputes unresolved issues and 
And now we are transforming this land after 40 years. This land was barren for 40 years. So all of my action, uh, I was saying earlier, all of my action collided with, with unjust uh, system and caused disruptions. Uh, and I was not aware of all these processes. So I encountered a lot of obstacles, systematic barriers and, and learned to respond uh, to hurdles and hardships mindfully along the way. And my artistic research eventually helped me to understand uh, uh, understand my own relational aesthetics, practice, creative uh, practice, uh, power dynamics, social structures, and, and the lateral thinking to, to, uh, to tackle the challenges inherent in the society and, 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 and all these social processes. So uh, I arrived at this point through a leap of faith, <laughs> right? I took a giant leap of faith. And in this discovery-driven process, I gained a lot of uh, perspectives and insights uh, and and most importantly, developed Zen habits to uh, to un, uh, to stay in the flow or to be uh, uh, to be uh, to be with the chaos in a chaos in a relaxed way. So this is what I'm doing now, and all this I'm generating these productive tensions into questions and appreciative inquiries. Uh, for the urban future, and I'm imagining, reimagining a city to uh, city, uh, and taking uh, new paths to charter new paths to uh, to reimagine our city. So that's my experience uh, so far. So look at the community engagement. It's very difficult, but uh, you can see women and children's participation. It's because uh, this community, compared to other communities, this community was a little bit of its affluent neighborhood, <laughs> and. Uh, so that also played some, uh, 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 it was a little bit easier comparatively. So we, I organized a lot of design chariots to uh, criticize our own designs, uh, to, uh, to recheck our I mean, like, uh, intentions and designs and motives and everything. And so I, 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 I mix up with ecologists, architects, other urban planners and other fields of people. So this is design activism or action architecture, I go and uh, in, encourage community to, uh, I co-design with the communities. Uh, so I organize these things in the, on the, in the ground instead of any rooms. All right. So yeah, these are, the, and these are all the volunteers just through my one single post on Facebook and request on Instagram. They all came together and made this, uh, happen. And, uh, so these are my team, uh, uh, like I said earlier, without any resources and organizational structures and any, any, any resources, we are doing this now. I'm at a point and I need to stretch, stretch, stretch this and then grow as a movement and, uh, and go collectively towards a common goal. Yeah. And yeah, so this is me. I am doing site supervision from the site and I, I, I employ a lot of playful elements into my own practice. And because it's, uh, a lot of there's a lot of stress in the field and in the site, so I call myself brands managers sitting up there, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so these are my uh, some of my pictures from all of my works and projects, ongoing projects, and uh, we're preparing for another uh, more public parks next year, I mean coming year. Thank you. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for that inspiring presentation, Milan. I think uh, the story of how advocacy can actually uh, go into action, or how can you, how can we uh, actually perform actions, was really inspiring. And um, yeah, I, I look for uh, so it was really uh, great to listen to you. Uh, with we'll come back to you during the Q and A um, session. But uh, now I would request Ahar to um, to talk uh, talk to us about her experiences so uh, bahar is an award winning environment uh, journalist and conservation uh, biologist and also author so i would request bahar to uh, share your experiences with us thank you so much madhura um, thank you for you know inviting me to this talk uh, i'm very i was very excited by the subject because it's close to my heart um, 
and thank you milan for that lovely presentation so many ideas there and so much to learn uh, from you and i just like to start by my bit by saying uh, that uh, you know while you've introduced me as a conservation biologist journalist i wear many hats but i think i started this what is called the mitti project uh, really in my frustration as a as a parent on the lack of public spaces in the city for children uh, and of course i live in a city which is which is very green i live in a fairly affluent neighborhood and yet i felt that it was not easy for me as a parent to access those public spaces with a toddler in tow uh, because i found that they were either filled with rubble or they were our idea of redesigning public spaces is to fill them up either with lots of fences or lots of plastic and to me uh, you know where does a child get close to nature uh, i felt that frustration that as a, you know we unfortunately we are all uh, you know we can't just pick up our bags and go to rural areas or go to you know national parks or so where does one get close to nature in the city so that's why i decided to create uh, the mitti project which is just i would call it a passion project so this is basically a two acre site and what you're seeing over here is it's just a regular agricultural field uh, but what i decided to do was i said i'll i'll build or construct on the site only with mitti with earth with earthen elements and i said i'm not going to you can see the flow tiles at the back over there that's because i had thatch over there and the thatch caught fire so those are the only sort of uh, you know the their mangalorean tiles but otherwise even that all that you can see everything was either bamboo thatch or mud and i was told that uh, architects told me that actually you know ma'am it would have been cheaper if you constructed with cement it's far tougher to find uh, to construct with alternative materials so again this is my frustration uh, you know with the current model of uh, the construction industry which is that it's cheaper for me to build uh, with with polluting materials than with non polluting materials so that is the irony of trying to go alternative or you know creating spaces which are natural uh, but anyway what you're seeing over here is this is just a small thatch roof at the back we had a mud wall so we finally worked with uh, you know a lot of alternate architects who do a lot of al alternative work and my plan was uh that people could come here and get close to nature and it wasn't just about roaming around uh you know on a on a agricultural plot uh what i call it is natural playscapes which is that a child could come and just stare at a you know a row of ants walking or they could uh, you know like in alice in wonderland moment there'd be nature trails there would be insect hotels there would be places where children could come and interact with nature um without having to say go to a jungle uh, safari which again i think is very expensive and as i said it was from my frustration of the kind of neighborhood parks we are developing which are full of steel and cement and there is no space for nature uh, in our city parks so i'm really glad that you know this project is happening uh, what madhura had shown uh, shared before i also looked at some of the documents on what wr is doing that sounds very exciting very promising so the, what you're seeing over here is uh, this is students from jindal university they came to the site and we blindfolded one student and we said all we want you to do is go and touch this tree and just tell us what do you feel what do you and we asked them to hug the tree we said can you hear any sounds uh so you know i had students telling me we've never even touched the surface of a tree we've never actually you know just put our ear against a tree and try to see what that sounds like uh so uh, these i mean these are very subtle transformations but it's it's i feel a way of just uh unlearning a lot of our conventional education and really getting uh and not just children but i would say adults close to nature and well we tried <laughs> planting some uh, you know organic vegetables and again what i found was the farmers over there kept coming to me and saying uh, ma'am why don't you put some fertilizer isme fertilizer dal do phir zyada hogega so you know i am why i'm sharing this is that the struggle to go alternative is uh, it's not an easy path to follow it has many uh, i would say obstacles along the way because we are so entrenched in a polluting carbon intensive economy
and this is just uh, these are some workshops i wanted to show you this because you can see the wall in the background which we made from mud and we used some bamboo to support the wall and the idea was to also grow some vegetables and again not put a drop of fertilizers on them and then also to train the farmers in that area because they have forgotten how to work with uh, without chemicals they've forgotten how to grow food without chemicals and uh, as i said the inspiration really came from my uh, two year old this is my two year old daughter and you can see all she was seeing was a ladybird this was her first sighting of a ladybird and the sheer wonder on her face inspired me to create uh, this uh, you know particular landscape which you see on the left that's the designs you know i just sat and cut out a lot of things about how i'm going to create this particular uh nature trail or the mitti project site um and again as i said the inspiration was my daughter who was 2 years old at that time and the wonder the sheer wonder she felt on seeing insects and flowers and bees and little things which i think we forgotten in the city i i come today wearing the hat of a parent uh, not just an environment journalist i come wearing the hat of somebody who yearns for nature in the city and i really hope that in the future we can design playscapes areas for children where they actually get their hands dirty and close to nature so that's what i uh, hope and not just for children from say you know privileged backgrounds but even you know children from not so affluent backgrounds are anganwadis how can we recreate our anganwadis in a way that children actually get to play with nature and biodiversity that's what i am craving Um, so I'll end here. I'll stop here. Thank you so much for listening to me, and thank you for calling me for this talk. Thanks, Paul. Well, that was that was an interesting story uh, about how you got inspired to create these spaces. Uh, so we will now open a quick uh, discussion for ten minutes. If if um, people in the audience wants to uh, ask any questions, or if panelists want to interact with each other, we'll we'll open it for. I really appreciate both of your work, you know, uh, and which is self-driven. That is, that is the that is the most uh, interesting part that it is self-driven. And um, uh, Milan, great work, you know, the transformation that you have done city-wide is amazing to see such work. It is not a joke. We all know that because we all are practicing and advocating in the same area, and that we have and. then we realize transforming this small small public spaces means so much you know and i just don't understand why the decision maker just just ignore all this you know it is such a we all like you know you see the happiness of the people see how they are loitering op- like you know and and uh, you know with the friends see the kids playing there so this small joy why we have forgotten this that it is so important for ourselves in a city and we becoming more and more you know materialistic and and why it is so difficult for us as a practitioner to make it understand that this is very important but but i think uh, you know i'm just talking about uh, you know sharing my thinking that you know we are okay the ex- practitioners or experts or whatever we call ourselves but i think we need more and more people like you guys you know we are not practitioners or who are not closely working with the government no but we need more and more voice like you people like you to get the transformation i think we can be just stand behind you guys to support but i think commendable work. thank you thank you i was just i i would just add that you asked that why don't we do more of this i think the problem is uh, that there there are no contractors involved there's no scope to make money in this and i think that's why i would say the governments are not that keen uh, to you know encourage such voluntary work because you know the contractor mafia then can't make their buck uh, but anyway that's just an aside as a journalist <laughs> i know yeah, but on on that actually i had a question for you uh, bahar that uh, now that you know that these kind of spaces are a need in our cities you know talking more about natural materials experiencing natural materials so um, are there any steps that you are planning to take in terms of how you are documenting this and how you plan to you know scale it up in the cities are there any steps you are planning to take uh, this i am talking to you from uh, you being the, from commun- uh, communications background i like. um, would like to understand yeah so madhura the great question I, i you know the thing is that this was really just 
to be honest it was a side indulgence uh, however privileged that sounds but the idea was that to just have this as a passion project and i really wanted children from all backgrounds uh, uh, to come to that site not just say a jindal university or a, you know a, a school and regarding how do you scale it up i don't know i wanted something for myself you know i feel that everything i've done is in the public domain as a journalist as a as an author so you know you go out there you want your books to be read by people and whatever but here i, I don't know how to scale it up to cities i'd be i would love to partner with somebody so say to do it with 10 schools across delhi uh, but then i don't want to get into the administrative hassle of having to write to the government and then get permissions because everybody knows i'm sure milan also went through it and sarita you also in the work that you do uh, swati i've yet to hear you i apologize but i'm sure each one of us in the work that we are doing uh, there's a lot of uh, you know admin red tape involved and i and i i honestly i've not thought of scaling it up i'm just about managing what i'm doing right now but i have i would say a sharp learning curve thanks to what happened just a day before we were to open this as a public space my entire site caught fire so the thatch caught fire that roof which you see got blown away uh, so uh, and uh, the next day we had a storm so we had made these thatch bathrooms and those got blown away so i've had a lot of learning on the job uh, which i am you know now i've learned the better way what do you what material you should build with how you should all that's there uh, but to be honest i'm going to be very honest no i haven't thought of scaling it up <laughs> i must say bahar you should contact swati actually swati <laughs> is expert in this I would love to add, uh, yeah, to what Bahar was saying. Actually, at this point, um, I totally second Sarika. Uh, brilliant work. I think this panel has been very well curated. Sarika's work, I'm familiar with, so I can say this um, already. And I think uh, Bahar, we need these passion projects because, um, in the language of uh, government projects and urban development projects. Uh, these are actually great pilot projects so uh, these are actually you know sort of acupuncture points um like the pocket uh, parks at milan has been working on yes. and and your sort of project as well and the whole idea of pilot projects is to fail the idea is to try something and what doesn't work you try something else and so that's why i think um i really love the self initiated uh, projects that both of you have started and uh, i think even for the nurturing uh, neighborhood um, challenge i think this is very very relevant to learn from because you know what these are providing are sort of proof of concepts uh, yeah. that you know uh, this aspect of it works and this aspect of it can be improved on so yeah. um, yes. you know even if you are not thinking of scale already there's so many ideas that practitioners can come up with uh, other people who are watching this right now can already pick up uh, you know strands um, of of your process and figure out how to scale it up uh, in their own context yeah. brilliant brilliant work thank you so much swati actually i i maybe i am just being too modest <laughs> because uh, i should add that as you asked me madhura about scaling up we have been scaling up i just haven't labeled it as such so we actually had the jindal school of architecture students come to this site and say that we are going to create prototypes for you and the students uh, then are learning literally it's like an open working laboratory for them so i'm also uh without realizing we i have been able to get the students to learn to build without cement right and they never had an open laboratory to be able to do that nobody told them come to our site and do this so that started unfortunately covid hit us and therefore you know then the students stopped coming but i still get calls from those students saying can we please come we're dying to come to that open laboratory and the other thing as i said was the farmers uh, groups that we've initiated in terms of work without chemicals that work is still happening so i'll stop here and uh, thank you uh, you know i i loved all the inputs can i add something else uh, is it Please. okay the the panelists are speaking to each other <laughs> sorry milan i'll just is it okay madhura can i yeah, yeah sure okay um so just one more quick point um i think uh, bahar uh, your work is also very important in shaping aspirations so today uh, our aspirations are shaped by how we see uh, development quote unquote right and so this is about sort of changing that challenging that supporting that and i think at that uh, level it becomes really important and i really like what you said about alternative practices uh i mean common sense is alternative today so i think you know these sort of uh, small projects are 
yeah so these sort of small projects are about changing those aspirations of even like the youth today of yeah. people like you and me who come from privileged backgrounds um practitioners definitely who can maybe set um, or reset these aspirations yes. so um it works at so many levels great great so uh, bahar that there's one question from audience i would uh, if okay. for you uh, so as a journalist how much do you see uh, this project that you've done covered in media what can media do to shape these spaces and what do you think communicating more about this can do or how can it help um, if if it is covered more yeah thank you for that question i think madhura it also relates to your question which is that yeah. if the media were to cover it it would help scale up uh, some of the ideas that i had um and i i think i was just trying to keep alive the child in me uh, which was that i don't get those spaces anymore where i could just stare at ants and watch them go home or whatever you know which i did as a child and i wish the same for my children regarding the media yeah i wish they would cover more of such stories um i had the privilege of being a journalist so i just wrote about it and i have to tell you that till today that i did it as a three part series for the hindustan times until today i get people coming to me and saying you're the person who set up that site so i think people there is a craving in the audience uh, amongst readers for such thing there is a fatigue with concrete with you know especially the pandemic has taught us that and i think people want to hear such stories people still stop me uh, you know and ask me about oh so you're the one who created that site can you tell us more about it we love that piece you wrote uh, so i i think we need to turn to our audiences more and see what people want and what kind of stories they want yeah i think that's the uh, that's the beauty of communicating the right thing yeah Okay. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that wonderful discussion, all of you. <laughs> let's let's move on to the further presentations. I'll now request uh, Sarika to um, to go start her presentation. Before that, uh, to introduce uh, Sarika. So Sarika uh, Panda Bhat is co-founder of Rahagiri Foundation and a key force in Haryana Vision Zero program. Sarika works extensively in the field of road safety, place making, women safety, and gender issues. um i request sarika to um start your presentation so this is uh, about uh, a 9 year old story i'm going to tell through my storytelling and i think this is what i see after 5 6 years milan and bahar's project also you know reaching to that line uh, so uh, the rahagiri and gurgaon uh, has a very very uh, very Uh, emotional story actually and uh, when we started rahagiri day and where where we uh, see it right now is very very overwhelming so it started uh, in 2013 uh, on uh, november and uh, we went to this uh, this administration and say that you know uh, gurgaon is becoming more polluted there is no public space for kids to play you know uh, the parks are full with parkings uh, the roads are full with cars uh, uh, and uh, the, even the neighborhood streets we we see that you know we can see the speeding cars and uh, even my uh, i myself i cannot let my daughter cycle even 500 meter so this is how a group of uh, citizens in gurgaon came together went to the government and said that give us few sundays to experiment what the city wants what the citizens in the city wants so we started ragiri in gurgaon and it scaled up to almost 70 cities uh, across india and all districts all districts in haryana all 22 districts in haryana uh, and uh, the chief minister himself in haryana uh, le- uh, took the ownership of uh, you know co-creating and starting the hagiri day in all the districts so that we can give back the street to the people to the kids and uh, you know uh, it's still going on when we started we thought of you know reclaiming the street for walking and cycling but slowly slowly it becomes a community event where the ownership was came from citizens from the schools from the corporate to basically promote a healthy lifestyle also to promote uh, a, a, a sustainable mobility also and from rahagiri day what we see 
is you know uh, people which the city which was too much of car oriented uh, is basically shifting towards more sustainable it's long way to go but you know the dialogue has been shifted from you know building more and more roads to how we can build more <clears throat> walkways and cycle track so the vision was basically uh, you know uh, a, uh, making this paradigm shift within the citizens and the decision makers there was always this question you know whose space is this street sir and what we believe you know is street is a public space and i think is the most important and the inclusive public space because if you see the parks in the neighborhood it is for the certain category of the people some parks only elders will use some parks only kids will use and kids from the residents will only use our domestic helps are caregivers kids cannot go to the park but <coughs> when you talk about streets it is for everyone for all gender all class you know and all kind of road users so this is where we said that you know it is a street is where we shared the legacy we shared the users and shared that belongingness and then we just randomly asked people you know that how you see your streets and how you want to reclaim it and we got all this kind of uh, you know uh, uh, basically thought process from the people and finally it comes to that you know streets should be more public and streets should be for people and not just for cars so uh, this again gives us more more and more um, thought process how we can re rethink about our streets so uh, uh, this what is what again you know we framed it you know what again you think you know when we think about socializing in the street so what all you think you know then where you see there are you know street vendors people eating on the street people loitering on the street people basically meeting their friends on the street and people and we have seen you know uh, not just to uh, commute it is has a lot of dynamic around you know you see this rickshaw puller even resting on the street a lot of things there are lot multiple things and in in india we have more other characteristics you know there it still become a space for animals also you know it's so much of dynamic so what we do in rahagiri day you can see in the pictures so we just come on uh, we just uh, sundays uh, we just cordon off certain stretch of the roads in uh, uh, in a busy street and then uh, we ask people to just come and enjoy the street so you can see people doing yoga people playing football you know from elders to kids you can see uh, you know dancing on the street and if you think about women empowerment and we talk to the women who go to the gym and do zumba and who do zumba in rahagiri day and they themselves say that you know they feel more comfortable more safe more secure while they are dancing on the street ragri streets oh, and nobody is you know uh, looking into them or nobody is judging them how they are doing they are open so how see if you are creating such street it is for everyone it gives that sense of security sense of belongingness to everyone from the women from the children to elderly to everyone so you can see varieties of uh activities that uh, you know uh, we have witnessed in uh, rahagiri sundays and after doing this uh, uh, you know doing this for years in many cities uh we stopped during covid of course we did little bit some cyclothon something something but of course during covid we could not come out and uh, do this kind of activities but post covid again everyone realized now i think not just us now the people more and more people realize that you know we need to go back to uh, sustainable living and, uh, and this is the right time we should walk towards it and then uh, from this sunday coming 5th of uh, september we are launching this neighborhood ragiri day and it is not just only busy street what we thought that we need to make safe this neighborhood streets also so 
we are reclaiming we are starting to reclaim the neighborhood street with the help from the district administration in gurgaon we are going we are going to organize this in uh, whole ncr you know noida faridabad and delhi also and here we are but we are make sure that you know wherever we are organizing this neighborhood ragri day the district administration the municipal corporation or the whom this street belongs to they should make it safe so working with the government to make it safe like you know the work has started where we we are uh, you know uh, improving the intersection we are making a speed limit of 20 in this neighborhood street where people literally jeep on 60 or 70 km per hour you know so <coughs> we are uh, just not doing this sunday event but working with the government to make it safe working with the rws working with the citizens group to make it safe for the children and for others so these are our basic strategies you know changing behavioral uh, behavior and the mindset of the people and somehow we were able to achieve that if i say that you know seven years back uh, you know people used to come and fight that you know car people people who buy a vehicle give road tax so the roads belongs to them not people to cycle or to dance or to do yoga and we fought it back but now what we see after 7 years we no need to fight with the people people come and ask us to organize this so this is the behavioral change uh, what we have seen then public outreach this is very important uh, you know uh, when we want more and more people to join us and uh, talk to the administration demand about the safe street to the administration for their kids for their kids future you know then this uh, uh, public outreach is very important so we did we keep on doing lot of awareness campaign uh, online campaign offline campaign engaging school kids working with the school kids going to their schools and doing workshop making a club inside the school so they can drive it so all this uh, still going on with multiple schools then capacity building of the stakeholders again you know uh, neither wri nor us no one we are not going to there for every time and everywhere we also have their our limitations so it is important to build the capacity of the decision makers and the city administration and the civic society group in the city so through our uh, classroom workshops also but demonstrating something on the street if you see we just demonstrate we took a street space and we said that see these are the cars you can see in the yellow patches these are the space that one car occupy with one person and if you get few cyclists and the same number of people in a bus or same number of people in a uh, who are walking then how much space they are occupying to give a sense because you know these people who design or who implement this construction work road construction work they all use cars they don't they never walk in the street so we organize lot of workshops with them let's walk in the street and ask them what all whatever what all you are feeling what are challenges you are feeling then they realize that oh it is so difficult to walk or so difficult to cycle you know uh, so this kind of capacity building workshop we keep on doing then adding government agencies more and more because this is very important to integrate this agencies you know everyone work in silos police doesn't know how to know what to do because there is a false intersection design and we ask police to manage it and it become very difficult to manage uh, uh, you know so then integrating this agencies together you know coordinating uh, basically adapting a coordinated approach to achieve uh, achieve whatever we want to making street safer basically then our uh, technical support right now what we are doing is you know that is one most important thing uh, you know uh, they are lacking they have money to implement the projects because they have if they are building wide wide uh, you know roads foot over bridges cycle uh, you know uh, flyovers and underpasses but always there is a question why can't they build a good cycle track good footpath good good complete street how, how can how can, why not can they can design this complete street so we realize that there is a capacity issue technical capacity issue so we started we said that hey we will give you that designs let's implement it this way let's stop doing more 
wrong infrastructure now let's work towards making a right infrastructure you know in less amount of money not even the same amount of money less amount of money we can do better work in for our city and for our citizens so this is some impact of rahagiri day uh, you know improving uh, intersections in uh, various cities what we are uh, doing through tactical urbanism we do this we do this trials as uh, like you know for some months and then showcase this to the government that see how it is working and then give them a detailed design and get it implemented this is uh, again uh, we are supporting the district administration in gurgaon for more and more complete street cycle tracks food paths and intersection improvement and finally we can see some changes on ground so this is again a uh, you know there are a lot of uh, mixed land use around it there are schools there are hospital there is residential area and there is huge commercial area and a lot of people walk in the city there is a government school and there is a uh, urban village also and a lot of kids actually walk and cycle to the school and then we said that let's improve this particular area and uh, let's start replicating in other areas too you can see this is a wide cycle an empty zone we created and uh, started with a you know cyclothon first time in a government office you can see a bicycle stand you know the ceo of the gmd opening it and then many of their employees started cycling to school including the ceo twice a week so this is the change then you think of you know if they walk the talk then only we can bring some changes in the city otherwise it's just impossible or very difficult we keep on doing this pop up and tactical urbanism you know creating this temporary cycle lanes in the city and where you can just see this just neighborhood kids just coming and cycling in sunday morning we are not organizing a full rahagiri we just created a cycle path and just came, kids came came to right bicycle on sunday morning of course lot of workshops lot of other work going on but this is the ultimate uh, work that uh, the work is going on and hopefully within a year we will able to uh, see this on ground so this is the first model street complete street in gurgaon and i think one of its kind in india i must say where a congested road in a industrial area where the administration supposed to cut all 400 fully grown trees and widening the road so we with the help from various corporates and the citizens group we were able to convince the administration that here here we don't need wide roads here we need wide wide walkways and cycle track and finally you know this uh, the work has been started and here we are going to have a wide cycle track food path e vehicles charging stations place to play because there are two major urban villages where a lot of again these kids don't have any public space to play or you know or, or to loiter so this street is going to be a live public space for them a park for them to play and here almost 80% uh, in the street people either walk or cycle because there are a lot of industries and the people from arbor village just walk or cycle to this industries so this is going to be one of its kind and you know uh, i can see some of this work from what milan has done and uh, you know bahar has done so this is what we are also doing trying to do in our neighborhood street little bit uh, to demonstrate you know how small small elements change the streetscape and how engage the people with this small things you know and this is one of the uh, uh, busiest market which is called sadar bazar inside that market we have two schools one is uh, you know girls schools and boys school and with this small elements what we see that you know lot of kids again started coming back to the street and started playing so uh, this is from my side you know and when we are talking about nurturing neighborhood the first and most important thing is you know the street because if you are going to play somewhere also if you are going to school if you are going to uh, your for your extra curricular activity you are commuting so the most important thing is you know how to uh, make this commute fun and safe is i must say is the most important thing thank you so much 
Great. Thanks, Arika. Ragini's story is always inspirational and um, it, you, you took us through a lot of uh, you know, steps in which uh, these, you have nudged behaviors over so many years and that's the reason somewhere we have come so far and implementing certain projects, um, focusing on, um, on people and not on the vehicles. So, um, great. Thanks, uh, Sarika. I would now invite Swati. For, uh, Swati is the founder of Social Design Collaborative. She is an architect, writer, community artist based in Delhi, whose work engages with house, uh, housing rights and urban informality in Indian cities. Uh, Swati, uh, you can, uh, can you please start your presentation? Thank you, Madhura. So the work that we do at Social Design Collaborative, um, we are a team of uh, designers, uh, essentially designers and architects, and we work in interdisciplinary um, collaborations. So with the human rights lawyers, with sociologists, with academic, uh, academics, um, activists, um, as well as um, economists. And the work that we do primarily is in uh, what are called informal settlements, so self-built um, neighborhoods um, in our Indian cities. Um, a large part of them are what are called squatter settlements or commonly referred to as slums. And we uh, believe that it's important to work in these neighborhoods because typically architects, um, engineers don't work in these neighborhoods. And this is where we feel design can play a very important role in supporting the residents. And so uh, consultations, stakeholder consultations uh, form a very important part of a process. Um, these debates, these arguments, uh, which um, then finally lead to consensus, I think are very important because um, only then a sense of ownership can be created. And ownership is actually very important for what we call ONM, uh, which is um, uh, operation and uh, maintenance, uh, because unless um, the uh, users and the stakeholders are involved in the design from day one, there will not be a sense of uh, ownership to then maintain uh, you know, whatever uh, space is being built or whatever is being created. Uh, that sort of maintenance is then taken over by people themselves if they feel that they have been a part of, uh, uh, you know, the whole process of designing it or bringing it up. So that's why it's very important for us. Um, so this encapsulates the process that we follow in most of our projects. Um, all our projects so far have taken place because uh, from a neighborhood, either a resident or a social worker who works there has gotten in touch with us, you know, either because there's been a fire or there's a need to build a community space. It could be an Anganwadi, it could be a school. And then uh, we hold community meetings. Uh, we find on-ground partners to collaborate with who have had a long relationship with the residents um, who uh, the residents in turn trust. And then the idea is to figure out what is the need really and uh, then identify a possible um, a solution. And because we're architects, we focus on um, spatial um, design. And uh, spatial design always is also complemented with um, uh, what we call soft features. The idea is to also um, iterate in the design process. So a lot of models is what we use. I'm going to show you a few of those. Creating partnerships for fundraising, for further support. And finally, a, a building team is identified. An action plan is drawn up. And then the uh, building process itself is uh, very incremental because the neighborhoods that we work in are very precarious uh, because of an absence of uh, land ownership, um, an absence of land tenure. Um, so because of that, many of these neighborhoods are considered uh, illegitimate or illegal. And that's why um, it involves a constant process of negotiation with the authorities. And uh, the building process is always incremental because of that. And then um, the team of builders then goes on to build other spaces. And that's what um, that's how we've been trying to scale up um, for the last few years. And it's very important for us to stay in touch with the uh, people that we build with. And this continued engagement is very important for us. And um, the kind of spaces we have been working on are community spaces and really what we call commons, where everyone comes together. These are uh, shared spaces. And uh, then people um, uh, figure out what they would like to use that space for. Or what is the most important sort of um, uh, space which is required? It could be a community center. It could be a school. Uh, this is a graphic which um, shows an Anganwadi uh, center, a daycare center, which we built um, in a basti in Delhi. And here, um, it was also important for us to figure out uh, low cost and temporary materials because of the precarious nature of the neighborhoods that I mentioned. Uh, it's not possible to build uh, permanent uh, structures. Uh, so they can only be either temporary or dismantleable. So we learn a lot from how people build already. What are the materials that we use? So you can see how we have kind of learned from uh, the sort of found materials that people um, have used in this basti. So um, uh, reuse sort of shutters, um, reuse ply, and 
uh, use the same materials to build and perhaps um, uh, change the building uh, technologies a bit. So learn from how people are rebuilding and uh, come up with a hybrid model of um, so-called technical know-how that we bring, uh, plus the technical know-how that people already have. Uh, in this case, um, the need for an Anganwadi came up um, because the whole Basti had caught fire. And so they got in touch with us to help them rebuild the Basti. And uh, to come up with a more durable um, system of construction, we all decided to build a prototype. And um, everyone felt that the prototype could be used as an Anganwadi. Uh, I mean, there were many deliberations about how a clinic was needed, it could be someone's house, but finally everyone settled on um, um, Anganwadi. And that's also how we started building more Anganwadis because we realized it's a very essential, important um, space in the community. It can also be a very important multifunctional space, uh, which can function as a school um, after the Anganwadi hours are over. It can function as a community space. And um, as I told you, we really like using a lot of models like most architects do. And these are of different scales. It's also very important for us to make them really um, sturdy, uh, very durable because people often, often play with them, the kids definitely. Um, so sometimes they're very small. You can see the toothpicks here that we've used to make this model. And sometimes they're really big. So we also make a lot of one is to one uh, prototypes because I mean, there's nothing better than being able to experience the space as it's going to be, uh, the idea of that space. And this was also very important for us when we built this for the Basti, we built it uh, you know, with the residents. Um, it was important for us to build this one is to one prototype because uh, the women were not really involved in the building process, as you can see. Um, that is Ruchika, who was a part of our building team. And so uh, the women came in after um, this prototype was built to then give their feedback on uh, what works, what doesn't work. We were exploring uh, different ideas for mezzanine where the kids could sleep. And so they helped us change the layout um, a bit. And uh, so these models also uh, become a very important way to bring in uh, people, uh, groups of people who might not be a part of these decision-making processes otherwise. We like to take a lot of uh, team pictures at the end of a hard day. And this is one of our earliest projects in which we had built a school. Um, this is called, the design is called a mod school, which stands for a modular school, because the idea was also that uh, more such schools could be built in remote areas who might not have, uh, that might not have access to services, uh, might not have access to electricity, for instance, to be able to use power tools. And in this case, we have used um, a lot of uh, local materials so in this case. As you can see, uh, bamboo has been used and also the traditional charpai weaving, which is uh, which is the traditional pot, uh, which we found uh, a very common practice in the area. So a few craftsmen were brought in uh, to be able to uh, build these doors and windows. All of them are pivoted. The idea was to make it as playful and open as possible. Uh, we didn't want to create, and also um, the, the uh, staff of the school didn't want to create a school which is um, just uh, you know four walls of a classroom. They wanted something which was very open, very airy. And of course, it was important for it to be very uh, low cost because the budget was very limited. And so this is a kind of um, classroom that you have. So uh, the school was built uh, for the children of farmers. And we have been, uh, we've had a long term engagement with the farmers along Yamuna in Delhi. And uh, now then we went on to design Anganwaris uh, for the farmers. So th this space, as you can see, uh, the design is a bit similar, but um, it's a much smaller space. We haven't been able to build these yet because then COVID um, happened. And uh, as you all know, uh, most of the work has stopped and it just um, basically uh, boiled down to basic survival and relief aid and, and access to dry ration. So we hope to start this again. Um, here, I want to talk about also how uh, Anganwari spaces have become a sort of, uh, you know, confluence, an overlap of formal and informal processes. So the formal uh, scheme, which is the ICDS, Integrated Child Development uh, um, Services Scheme, and the informal uh, building processes um, of the community. Uh, because, um, I, like I mentioned, the, uh, the, these settlements are considered uh, illegal often, uh, but the ICDS uh, scheme, uh, uh, one can avail whether the status of the neighborhood is legal or illegal, right? Because wherever there are people, wherever there are more than 800 people, it's possible to avail the scheme from the government, from the Women and Child Welfare Department. And so, uh, in a way, in uh, building these spaces, um, it's also helped the residents assert their right to be there. They claim, you know, uh, to be there in the city. And uh, that's why these multifunctional spaces we're realizing are a very uh, good idea uh, to help these um, settlements, to help these neighborhoods also assert their right to the city. The design that we have been working on has uh, been evolving uh, over time. Uh, we believe that spatial design can play a very important role in improving also the learning environment and consequently the quality of services. So in this case, the Anganwadi service, the ICDS service. 
And the work that I've shown you so far um, is uh, very bottom up, very, at a very grassroots level. Uh, but we also work at a policy level because, again, we feel it's very important to bring the two together because the acupuncture that we were talking about is very important. But to be able to scale up, we also need to be working at a policy level. Um, so I work as a consultant um, in something called the Cities Project, um, which stands for the City Investments to Innovate, Integrate, and Sustain uh, program. So this is um, this was a challenge, just like the nourishing neighborhoods is a challenge. So this was a challenge um, for which, um, uh, this was a smart city a project challenge for which um, 12 cities uh, were shortlisted. And so I'm working um, in two cities in Andhra Pradesh, uh, Vishakhapatnam and Amravati, the new capital, uh, which was planned. Uh, which which has been um, which has been stalled for the time being. Um, so we have been working uh, in the 25 villages there, the villages which are already there, and the people, the residents who have already been living there. Um, it involves um, creating anganwadis and uh, healthcare centers in these villages, and also upgrading government schools. So uh, my role um, as a domestic expert. Um, is to um, facilitate uh, stakeholder consultations in terms of guiding uh, the SPD, the special purpose vehicle, on those processes, on participatory processes, and also coming up with capacity development strategies. Um, so the work has been really fulfilling, and um, uh, I think the SPD is doing a very good job. Um, I was just there um, uh, a week back, and I wanted to show you um, some of the work um, that they have been up to. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on not just creating physical infrastructure, but also on um, what we are calling soft measures. Um, so this, um, so here I wanted to talk about the example of the Anganwaris, which they are setting up in um, in the villages there. As you can see, these are the Anganwari workers. Um, this is a stakeholder consultation which has been going on. And even during COVID times, um, the team has been busy uh, holding these consultations. It's been really important for them. Over, I think, hundreds of consultations have taken place. Last I checked, there were over 500. And uh, I'm sure it's crossed uh, uh, like uh, uh, a thousand now. And during COVID, how they managed it um, is a hybrid model of online and offline. As we know, not everyone has access to digital technology. And it's not possible to then meet um, as a group uh, because of um, uh, COVID responsive uh, protocol, which is required. So they came up with a system in which um, they have a very uh, extensive network of on-ground facilitators. So they would um, uh, ask people to come to the community centers and uh, with adequate social distancing and very few people in a hall, uh, they would connect to the team online. So the architectural team, here you can see Mrinmai, um, she's the uh, team lead and um, show them the design, ask them for their feedback. And there's a thumbs up that they are giving to the team that this design is okay, it works for us, it addresses our concerns. And this is the sort of setup. So you can see there is this laptop. And through this laptop, uh, this group here is connected to the team in AMRD, which is Amravati Municipal, um, uh, sorry, Metropolitan Regional Development Corporation. Um, so the team started by identifying who are the different stakeholders. Um, so the Andamari workers, uh, the helpers, the village elders, um, the students, um, the, uh, the pregnant and lactating mothers, um, adolescent girls and women from the age of 18 to 45 years. And they also came up with a strategy of what these stakeholder consultations uh, should look like. So it involved uh, questionnaires and a big name, which became much more interactive, uh, became visual mapping with the, uh, with the uh, potential user, uh, users um, and a lot of creative games and focus group discussions. And so here again, you can see uh, Mrinmai and she's uh, showing different aspects of the design to one stakeholder group. And of course, also very in, uh, important to interact with the children themselves um, through, uh, you know, through uh, simple games, through simple activities. Another one of the stakeholder consultations. And so uh, I wanted to highlight a few uh, uh, concerns which came up, you know, a few sort of uh, feedback which came up in the beginning, which then informed the design process. So uh, these are the set of um, requirements which came from the Anganwari workers. Um, so in Anganwaris, uh, most Anganwaris in India, uh, you will see that uh, there is a huge shortage of space. Uh, there is a, a shortage of space for storage. And also um, many of the activities are conducted in the same space. So there is a need for segregation of these activities. Often what will happen is pregnant and lactating mothers uh, might need to have a health checkup, but there is no private space uh, you know, to create that sort of, a, uh, to screen that activity. And often they come for these checkups while the kids are um, you know, either um, having a midday meal or they're sleeping and so that becomes really difficult for them and uh, it was also very important for the Anganwari workers to talk about the materials 
because they're also taking care of the of the cleanliness of the upkeep of the place they're cleaning it themselves so these conversations actually boil down to the nature of the stone which would be used um, on the flooring for instance and they give feedback like we want something which can be cleaned by just um, throwing like a bucket of water uh, you know on the floor and so the kind of stone which would be required or any other kind of um, uh, flooring such as cement flooring these kind of conversations uh, came up from the village elders uh, the community leaders uh the kind of inputs focused on um the uh, the equipment which is required um the sort of uh, uh better furniture which is required which can be ergonomically designed um and of course um access to working toilets because most of these anganwadis do not um, have these uh, have proper toilets uh, in fact in uh, my discussion with the team um uh, a week back uh what also came up was the need for separate toilets so in the beginning um the designs were uh, you know it was just one toilet for boys and girls because it was felt that if they're only uh, you know till 6 years old uh, it's it's okay kids are comfortable using the same toilet but uh, when when we started talking you know uh, more in detail with the anganwadi workers uh, with the cdpo the kind of um, insights which came up is that uh, while the girls use the toilets if there's a girl inside then the boys would wait outside and sometimes what happens is then they would just go and pee in the open right because uh, if you you know if you wait for too long so even if you're providing a much better anganwadi you're not really solving uh, the issue uh, unless you really understand the detail of that issue so it sounds very simple but i think it's a very important detail and so now the team is providing separate toilets for boys and girls and uh, uh, different options so there are closed cubicles um, but there are also open uh, half pants for girls uh, squat pants and there are also um, urinals but you know just a vertical wall like karappa with karappa stone on it for uh, boys um so there are three options of going um, to the toilet and that's so important because uh, young children do not want to go in, into closed rooms right i mean they all, they often want to be in a space where they can be supervised uh, if needed they can be supported if needed but at the same time if you want a closed cubicle that option should also be there um so moving on uh, other sort of inputs from them were you know the need for a cooking area and of course making sure that these anganwadis which are uh, you know government uh, uh, daycare centers are at par with private daycare centers because today everyone wants to send their kids to private school um um we all went to private schools because government schools are looked down upon it's it, you know it's it's just the standards are not at par with private um, school standards or private anganwadi standards so can we create projects where they are at par maybe even better so these were the kind of inputs that uh, came from the uh, from the community the need for maybe even a uniform and then from the uh, women the pregnant women the lactating uh, mothers uh, there was a need for the waiting area like i was mentioning a separate space um, where they could be um, uh, screened um, health checkup could uh, take place and then finally these are a few quick renders um which i can share at this point uh, the city has already started its work with pilot projects and very soon um there will be uh, you know these 64 uh, 67 projects of health centers anganwadis then upgraded schools in the 25 villages uh, over the next year i really look forward to how it shapes up um so a quick look at the design a lot of bala elements have been used so bala stands for building as learning aid as introduced by kabir washpai and uh, it's a very simple strategy of integrating uh, it's a, it's a pedagogical a strategy of integrating uh, you know learning tools in the architecture of the space you know so on the flooring on the walls on the ceiling sometimes so you know there is a, a sort of a, a play circle um, you know these are the sort of comets um, the solar system which can be just integrated um, in an open space on the flooring uh numbers uh, steps are often numbered so that uh, mathematical tables can be represented on them another sort of um, example you might have seen it's a very popular one is learning angles uh you know just when by the opening of the door you can learn about different angles so it also becomes integrated with the syllabus um, of the children i mean in this case of course um, uh, this is an anganwadi so it's much more elementary it's much more basic so playing with the shapes and playing with colors so all of this is an important part um, for the design and there is of course a central courtyard which is also covered from the top with the manglo tiles with the ventilation um, all around uh, because that's why an anganwadi is right an anganwadi is a courtyard shelter and uh, to uh, conclude i just wanted to share that um, 
um, based on the work that we have done, uh, we have come up with a small pocket book on ICDS. Um, so Milan was talking about pocket parks and we have come up with a pocket uh, book. Um, this is just a very simple sort of um, immersion um, into what the ICDS uh, scheme really is for anyone who wants to uh, know more about it. And also uh, there are a few initial policy recommendations and design strategies that our team has compiled from various sources. But next, what we uh, hope to follow with is a compendium, a design manual, uh, which will compile all the case studies um, of uh, you know, good Anganwari design. So, of course, Amravati is a case study and uh, many other case studies from around the country. And I hope this would be useful for the SPVs who are participating in the Nurturing Neighborhood uh, Challenge. Um, and then the pocket book um, uh, has um, aspects like this, has uh, different uh, pages like this. For example, this talks about the difficulties faced by the Anganwari worker, um, which range from, uh, you know, just the distance of the Anganwari from their home um, to um, lack of community support to uh, sort of incommensurate uh, wages, um, etc. Um, so you can access this uh, in, on our website, in our open source section. We like to put all our designs, all our work in the open source section. And uh, we recently launched this booklet. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the discussion now. And I hope this has been helpful. Great. Yes, Swati. I think um, this was really um, great in terms of inspiring all the cities who are uh, implementing different designs or, or different, uh, you know, implementing designs or making designs around Anganwadis and spaces around Anganwadis that, you know, how important it is to talk to community to, you know, actually uh, make, you know, make changes in their design or what, how, how those comments or how those inputs from community is helpful in making certain design works work so i think uh, that was uh, that was a great takeaway from your presentation and uh, now i'll i'll open uh, the uh, now i'll open the session for question and answers uh, so i'll request uh, anyone to type in questions uh, if they have meanwhile i i have something to ask all of you actually that um, in all of your work uh, so so all the work that it actually sort of you know uh, counters the traditional way of thinking like um, uh, you know, traditional theory, way of thinking was always about streets are, are for cars or, you know, these kind of things. Like Milan also is, has worked on, you know, like the parks have to be in certain way, but, you know, challenged that uh, typical uh, traditional ways of designing a space or, you know, ways of how to play. Even Swati, you, you, spoke, you are uh, designing spaces which are, you know, really different from the traditional, way, in, the traditional ways in which they are designed. So in, in, in such cases, how do you shift or change ideas that are, you know, culturally embedded in, in people's mind? And, you know, that, that could be in, in minds of people, that could be in minds of government stakeholders. So, you know, how to actually um, um, shift or change these ideas around it? Is this for me? Um, yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Swati, please. I'll check after you. No, no, please feel free. Yeah, Milan, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, in my case, it's, it has been like, uh, it's so hard to change the mindset. Uh, it reminds me of a quote uh, from a film called Mat Matrix, where they said, when people are so, you know, like they are hopelessly, uh, uh, they refuse to unplug from that, but from uh, from they're so inured to the system, so you can't do anything. But that doesn't mean that you leave it there, right? You have to do what you can. Uh, so there's a common narrative uh, in Nepal. Maybe it, it implies in India as well, right? Uh, uh, there is no opportunity, a good platform for people who really want to do good, and they escape the country. It's so easy for the escape, escapism. But uh, I question, well, and what did you do uh, from there, right? And what and what did you do uh, to make a difference? So it's it's very uh, tough. It needs sustained attention. It needs sustained uh, active engagement. Not just like I said, one time event. It, it needs it needs a uh, lot of uh, and uh, we need to actually. When I first started uh, going to, uh, approaching with uh, uh, with with a sort of activism kind of thing, they were kind of worried and they were avo they avoided that. So I thought we, I need to reinvent activism and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, use others other ways of creative ways to uh, you know like build relationship and uh, get my work done, but without letting them know that what I, I mean like 
you just hack the senses, hack the system. So the, it takes a lot of uh, strategies, patience, and uh, uh, and uh, to overcome frustrations, uh, a lot of things. So you need to be equipped with so many uh, uh, things before you enter this uh, territory. So that was my case. But I, but equally, there was so much learning along the way. Uh, so I'm not sorry, we can't see you. you. I'm Just, here. Uh, yeah, yes, now we can see. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, there's kind of this, uh, they're attached to this, there's a cultural perception of the, uh, the, this, this uh, government officials plus citizens alike, the public spaces should be, uh, you know, like uh, treated like this or designed, uh, they, they fill up everything, right? So, and uh, I tell them it needs to be flexible and, and leave it flexible and see how that sublime space unfolds you know like or uh, what it does to you or what how people shapes it so to 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 make them uh, realize this i had to go through i had to face a lot of reluctance to uh, to uh, uh, discard or uh, reduce the overlaid materials based on consumptions and much our consumption patterns and materialisms and all these things so the it uh, uh, it goes it's 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 all into I mean like it's not easy it's not easy but uh but 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 the joy but the thing is uh i uh i'm interested where the challenge is there's a saying right so uh i'm i'm designed for that so with that with this attitude uh and and uh, this is my case. It might not be the same with others, but this is how I'm learning and unlearning and doing what I can and reinventing myself in the process. Yeah, I think patience is the key, as Milan said. And um, it's, it's basically a very slow process. I mean, that's the only way to, you know, be able to change things and also take people along. Um, also, it needs to be incremental. Um, and, and that's why, um, you know, it's very complex because it will take a long time. You know, it needs to be a long term sort of engagement. And that's why these things don't happen because bureaucrats, you know, get transferred, parties change and everyone wants to implement something visible, something loud, uh, you know, before the term ends. And that's why you don't have so many slow uh, and deep projects uh, because, uh, well, it doesn't work. I mean, you know, um, it's, it's a very... Uh, uh, short term that you have to be able to uh, convince people that you're doing a good job. Um, so I think that's the sort of um, that's the sort of challenge um, that we all face. Um, but I think um, if we are able to take people along, if we are able to do a lot of listening, then it is definitely possible. And also, I think um, the soft measures that I was mentioning, and also uh, I think uh, what this panel is also focusing on, is also very important. So it's not just um, you know creating this infrastructure, but unless it is connected to capacity building, unless it is connected to training, unless it is connected to how in the long term will it be maintained, what we call operation and maintenance, uh, this will not work. You know, you create something and then like one year later, it's not being used for what it was envisaged to be used uh, for. Or five years later, the sort of funding for maintenance is run out and then like now it's lying defunct. So these things are also very important and trainings especially. So uh, for the Anganwaris um, that we have been uh, working on um it's not important to just create nicer anganwaris you know which have a better learning environment unless it is also complemented with training of the anganwari workers on uh, you know how these sort of um, facilities um, can be used and there's also so much more that can be done but of course without overburdening the anganwari workers because they're already so overburdened there's so much paperwork so much documentation that they also need to take care of uh, but also so much more can be done with very simple uh, trainings such as um, uh, one thing I was thinking about is when it comes to children with disabilities um, there is a, a, a so much that an Anganwadi can do in uh, early identification of children who need um, you know specific support which you know comes in at a school level um, uh, and there are sometimes uh, you know dedicated classrooms for special needs um, uh, children uh, again you know there's a different school of thought which says that um, these students should also be integrated with uh, with other students in any case it happens at a school level but at an anganwari level also we need to be talking about it and these things can only be done um, you know through training through capacity development and um, yeah i think this is the sort of uh, you know change that we're talking about 
at a policy level which takes um, honestly takes decades right and um, i think um, every sort of um, government every sort of new team building on the work of the previous team and not sort of disrupting it that's also very important but you can't do much about that i guess yeah political instability robs the uh, or it hijacks uh, your the process the procedures and all your plans pre plans and everything and as an artist as a visionary as as a, as a, as as, a, as with the vision money the vision you you visualize something you go travel to the future and they don't see it right and you bring it here to bring, to bring gifts from the futures from the imaginary imaginations and you show it to them and they don't see it and it's very hard and difficult to see I mean like to show something and the people don't see it <laughs> so you need to travel back to the past <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> so i think you know uh, what milan and swati said is like the same thing you know you have these challenges if no you will get one officer who is really on your side talking your language or oh, passionate same person having you know showing the same passion and do want to do something like that and then the transfer happens and then you are back to square but i think uh, you know mm, this is a continuous a continuous fight i must say because uh, if you if, if you want to really make this paradigm shift you know in short period of time then it has to be national race otherwise it's not going to happen for example uh, you know if you see this accessible india i know a few of my friends were working on it and they were talking about this whole accessible india making accessible buildings making all the like you know streets everything is and they are they were continuously uh, you know advocating about it but the day our honorable prime minister launched this accessible india campaign now you see this transformation in the government buildings and multiple state has adopted it so well so something like that can make a uh, you know scalable change but i think uh, all the panelists or so many people around uh, multiple countries and especially in india we see individuals are doing so much in uh, you know in uh, multiple cities and this small small cat changes bring the catalyst to this you know bigger changes and uh, there you demonstrate you know see how the things are working through demonstrations through this best practices little bit of case studies i think slowly will change the mindset and slowly it's changing definitely it's changing for example i say if uh, right now in gurgaon if we are taking one lane from a carriage way and making footpath and cycle track on that lane nobody is going to oppose it now nobody is going to because people uh, people has changed and government also slowly changing so slowly think like i think all developed countries also to decades to bring about the changes if you give new york example or uh, you know how paris is working and it that also took i think 3 decades 4 decades to to bring that change in on the ground and i think uh, we are working towards it so let's not uh, let's have hope that we are going to bring these changes and we are also going to make our cities our country a beautiful livable and healthier city for our kids and for everyone yeah great that, that's that's really important to have those champions created in the city so that you know they take take those things forward and um, you know things are implemented slowly whatever time it takes but yeah so creating those champions in the cities having it is very important yeah that's that's great so uh, actually in the interest of time we'll uh, we'll take one more question uh, so okay so um, now in in like the the questions regarding the current situation the pandemic situation what what we all of us are going through and um, so these spaces that we, we are talking about public spaces and uh, so what what do you think that what is the role of such spaces or these activities like you know uh, play or or you know these these play activities or 